different to the time we do that because we don't feel safe. So I think we're okay with that. So, can I uh, uh, welcome uh, uh, you all, uh, both the witnesses on our first panel and the number of people in the public. Uh, and it's glad to see a number of people um, come along this afternoon uh, to join us. Um, uh, this is the seventh hearing um, of the Portfolio Committee Number Two's inquiry into health outcomes and access to health and hospital services in rural, regional and remote New South Wales. My name's Greg Donnelly and I'm the chair of the committee. The inquiry is examining health outcomes, access to services, patient experience, planning and capital expenditure in rural, regional and remote New South Wales. Before I commence, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Burpay Nation who are the official custodians of this land and I would like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging of the Burpay Nation and extend that respect to other Aboriginals present or who may be joining us on the internet. Today we are hearing from a number of stakeholders including local community groups, medical professionals, private citizens and the local health district. I thank everyone for making the time uh, to give uh, their evidence today to this important inquiry. Before we commence I would like to make some brief comments about the proceedings uh, this afternoon. Uh, today's hearing uh, is being broadcast via the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearing will be placed on the committee's webpage uh, when it becomes available in a day or two's time. In accordance with broadcasting guidelines, media representatives, uh, and uh, I think some media representatives are either here or about to join us, um, are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the committee's proceedings. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make to the media uh, or to others after you've completed your evidence this afternoon. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. In that regards, it is important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry's terms of reference and avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the Legislative Council in 2018. If witnesses are unable to answer a question today and want more time to respond, they can take a question on notice uh, written answers to questions taken on notice are to be provided uh, within 21 days back to the committee secretariat. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, uh, they should do so uh, through the committee staff. And I note uh, already that three documents have come forward and we'll deal with those as we come to them uh, shortly. In terms of the audibility uh, of the hearing today, I remind both committee members and witnesses to speak into the microphones. Now there's two, two microphones before us. There's th these ones which are mounted, which is the microphone for the, the sound inside this room. Now they've been placed reasonably close to us uh, because they need to pick up the, the, uh, the, the voice, uh, the clarity of the voice and project that. So um, don't need to push them back or bring them forward. They should be just in the right spot. And these ones mounted on the tripod uh, are for Hansard who that's the official record, as you know, of the Parliament. Uh, we'll be recording uh, your contribution this afternoon. Uh, finally, uh, could everyone please turn them, if I've not done so already, please turn their mobile phones to silent uh, for the duration uh, of the hearing. So, with our first panel, uh, we've got the uh, formality of having you sworn or affirmed to give your evidence. So, um, the way we proceed is this way, is that um, starting from my left, uh, Mr Wood, uh, and then moving across to my right, um, I'll ask each of you to please state your name, uh, your position title if you're representing an organisation in terms of your evidence this afternoon and swear either an oath or affirmation, whichever you prefer, the words of both should be before you. So we'll start with Mr Wood and then we'll move across to the other side. Mr Wood, thank you. Thank you. I swear that the evidence found and offered to be by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help me get it. Thank you very much, Mr. Wood. Uh, Ms. Jenkins. 
Thank you very much. Now I apologise I've got something in front of me that looks like something out of Doctor Who uh, but I'm reassured it's actually a camera on a tripod so I'm sorry I can't see you but I'll just move slightly and be silent. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Judy Hollingworth, founder, uh, former chair and currently deputy chair of Manning Valley Bush for Palliative. Thank you. And uh, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and, uh, and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. This is Katsamangos. Hello, um, I'm Bree Katsamangos, Program Manager with Mission Australia and convener of Mid Coast for Kids, who I'm representing here today. Thank you. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, Ms Foster. I'm Melissa Foster. I'm a parent um, sharing my daughter's inquiry and right. um, I, swear, I swear that the evidence now that I'm about to give by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that. Uh, now, can I just confirm that uh, each of your respective organisations uh, have made and we've received and processed your submissions to this inquiry. So. Um, with the uh, Manning Great Lakes Community Health Action Group. Uh, your submission is 678 to this inquiry. Uh, convener, uh, oh, sorry, mid, mid Coast for Kids um, and with respect to the uh, uh, Child Care Services and Tari Districts uh, Playgroup uh, 166. Uh, for the Manning Valley uh, Push for Palliative, your submission is 167. Uh, so they're all uh, being received. Thank you very much. They're very helpful submissions to this inquiry. They've been processed and have been uh, placed onto the uh, inquiry's webpage, so they're in the public domain. Um, so in saying that, you can take it as read that those submissions uh, have been looked at and, and read by the committee members. So I'm going to invite uh, respectively the organisations to make an opening statement shortly. Uh, and there's no need to go into deeply what's contained within your submission, but perhaps rather just set it up with maybe three or four minutes at the maximum um, of your particular focus and attention you want us to, to look at this afternoon. And then once we've got through all of them, um, if you're agreeable, we'll wave it up from questions from the various committee members around the table. So is everyone happy with that proceeding that way? Thank you. Well, as a matter of convenience, we move from my left to right. Mr Wooden, would you like to make an opening statement? Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to appear before you today. Manning Great Lakes Community Health Action Group was formed five years ago by Alan Tickle in response to a serious accident here at this race course, which resulted in our hospital minutes away being bypassed and five jockeys being transported to Port Macquarie Base Hospital over 70 kilometres away, which outraged the community and impacted on the golden hour of treatment. Our committee covers a broad spectrum of the community and comprises of four nurses, two paramedics, with a combined clinical experience of 231 years, a teacher, a financial planner with a local government experience, and an accountant. We have been lobbying since conception for extra funding for our hospital and for extra staffing and specialists, whilst at all times supporting all categories of existing staff and have never been critical of them. Manning Hospital's clinical services plan expired in 2017 and a new clinical services plan was completed in 2001 but has not yet been released. Local hospital council and communities need to be involved in the annual review of the CSP and business plan. The Premier's plan for health services delivery should cascade down through the agencies bound by a chain of accountability with 12 month reviews. We are a 160 bed hospital, yes, yet the national bed allocation per 1,000 patient population is 2.5. And based on this, Manning Hospital should be a 250-bed hospital with equitable and funded resources. The Heart of a Quality Study 2017 clearly states that the federal seat of Lyme has the worst cardiovascular outcomes in the whole of regional Australia. We need to build and fit out a cardiac catheterisation lab at Manning Hospital supported by an adequate number of cardiologists, specially trained nursing staff, 
equipment and ongoing funding. We need also to increase our ICU beds in proportion to the population reflected on national standards. ED, emergency department, needs to be fully funded and staffed for 16 beds instead of the current funding for nine. We need a 10-bedded short-stay unit to provide 48 hours comprehensive care to patients to ensure a safe and efficient admission process. Professor Zoff Balos states in his 2016 trauma review, Manning Hospital needs to be brought up to the level of a primary acute care hospital, such as Maitland Hospital, or a level three trauma hospital, such as Port Macquarie, Coffs Harbour, or Tamworth. Ear, nose, and throat services is extremely minimal, with specialists only visiting two to three days per month. This is totally unacceptable. Need to have provision for eye surgery to be attended locally. Manning Hospital needs at least one more operating theatre. There are long wait times for elective surgery. There is a serious lack of specialists, doctors and nurses and auxiliary staff in rural healthcare facilities compared to the metropolitan areas, which leads to a poor health outcome. Bullying in the workplace is endemic in health and is not being adequately or appropriately addressed. Closure of the 16-bed T-basis dementia unit without warning has had a huge impact on the hospital and community. This area requires also increased funding for our ambulance service plus provision for on-call services. This area is a low socio-economic region with higher incidence of chronic disease in each person, which requires a significant loading for all hospital, medical and auxiliary services. The incidence of cardiac and renal disease, diabetes and eye and ENT problems is much higher in our indigenous community. Currently, there is no oncology radiation treatment available in the Manning Great Lakes area. area. A radiotherapy cancer centre needs to be funded and established locally. We feel that we require a standalone ward at Manning Base Hospital for palliative care patients, plus a hospice. Now that the 16-bed T-base unit is idle, this would be an ideal spot for a hospice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very detailed and um, <laughs> comprehensive uh, opening statement. Um, now, Manning Valley, uh, Pusher Pally, uh, did you plan to share your opening statement or, or one of you are going to do it? So, um, I, I, I'll do it. Now. That's fine. Thank you very much. Well, please proceed. Chair. Thank you. Um, I just want to say um, I'm going to pick up, I'm not going to, Mr Woods has covered quite a number of things that are relevant to us. I'm not going to pick that up. I'm just going to highlight what I think are the key themes coming out of the various submissions. Thank you. Um, but really, the, it seems to me the baseline is, is to e fairly balance the allocation of resources in the health system across metropolitan, rural, remote and regional. And most of what we're hearing, or about to hear today, or yes. we, you've had, yep. indicates that's not, not the case, and it hasn't been the case for a long time. And so when you strip out local services and centralise things, the costs centralised things, the cost for people like us goes way up and the health outcomes and the actual health services diminish and also the expertise flees the area. So just some key points about these are statistics from local government um, information yep. just to highlight 95,000 people living in this area we believe at t uh, 2021. And 53% of the population in 2016 was 50 years of age or older. So time has gone by since then. Mm. And health practitioners are now in the hospital and community health area estimating that about 60% of the people they see are in the 60 years and older bracket. And so you can predict what that means. It means people are, mm. and this is one of the, this is the, oldest electorate, I think, federally in the country, and certainly it's one of the oldest in the state. And um, so we anticipate that by 2026, about 24% of the population will be over 50 years of age. And um, there's another, there's something else which has occurred recently, you might be aware of the inrush of interest in real estate in non-metropolitan New South Wales. That's been occurring in, uh, in this area and many others rurally, regionally, and that means that there's now an affordability issue coming up for people about housing and 
being able to access things and actually even find somewhere to live. So, so uh, the employment uh, indicators are 50% of the population in our area are not in the paid workforce and that healthcare and social assistance sectors are the largest employers, which tells us some more about the profile and the demographic, demographic of the population. And given the health incidents and trends seem to be that given that 53% of the population is over 50 years old, the need for health services is already high and will continue to increase into the future. So we're expecting that. And so, are the health, so is the health community. And you will know about our CIFA index of disadvantages 928, which places us at 107 out of um, 130 LGAs five years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got, I've got a paper here up which I would like to table, which I don't have time to go through, obviously. I want to make six points, though. Could you just identify, is this the one that we've received or another one? We've actually received no, a single I page. No, I just, these are my notes for today, like Mr. Okay. Wood Okay, no, no, yes. no, okay, that's it's, fine. It's really thematic rather than specific. No, that's fine. Just conscious of the time for the opening statement so that maximises okay. our questioning opportunity. So if you can just, uh, if, if just we're going to receive it because it's in writing, yeah. uh, you can just uh, highlight perhaps the key okay. points, yeah. So really, look, the main point is early access and intervention for our services and the other kinds already described make a whole lot of difference to affordable... It, it just means if you don't intervene early, the cost goes up. It doesn't look like it straight away, but it comes through in the medium and the long term. So that's affordable care and affordable access. Quality of life and cost savings disappear. More urgent and therefore more urgent and acute costly care is then required. Sorry. Um, it overloads the professional and carer community, which also impacts their well-being and their effectiveness, and it causes burnout and attrition. And... Um, this, in, the, in our case, due to the lack of adequate state government funding, a poor electorate is obliged to fund its own urgent short-term at-home care, which I cover further down in the paper. And this gap is filled by organi organisations like us, which is fundraising for an from an already impoverished community. So I'll leave it at that and just Thank submit you. the rest no, of that, the paper. That's lovely. That's, that's very good. Thank and you. we've got that document, uh, and perhaps the Secretariat might pick that up. Um, that will be helpful for us. So thank you for that, and I'm sure some questions will arise from that. So, Mrs. Katzmangos, would you like to make an opening statement? Thank you. Um, Melissa is here with me, and she'll be sharing a personal story, but I'm, I will do the, the summary for thank Mid Coast you. for Kids. Thank you. Uh, so just as a precursor to, to what I'll state is that um, we know that children who have a strong school transition do better across a whole range of domains um, than their peers that don't. So we are very much focused on um, early developmental screening and ensuring that all children have access to high quality, timely services when they need them prior to starting school. So on the Mid-North Coast, one in three children are in the vulnerable young children group. The state average is one in five. On average, these children are estimated to cost the New South Wales government $171,000 each for the key human services they will use up to the age of 40. This is 2.9 times higher than the New South Wales, for all New South Wales children aged 0 to 5. Mid Coast for Kids has spent the last 12 months investigating the early developmental screening system on the Mid Coast Further to the recommendations outlined in the submission and in response to the issues highlighted, I'd like to make a couple of recommendations and I will table this document so that you have a copy of those. That would be appreciated. We endorse the New South Wales Government's Brighter Beginnings initiative and through that the Government's commitment to give every child in New South Wales a strong start. We consider near universal before school screening provided by child and family health nurses through community health to be the gold standard when it comes to comprehensively assessing and responding to children's early developmental health needs. We call for greater capacity and flexibility in child and family health services and how they are delivered. That is integration of services into early childhood centres and integrated service hubs. We call for the reinstatement of the Medicare benefit for the preschool, the preschool Healthy Kids Check, including the nurse item number previously 10986, with evidence that children are not accessing the three and four year health check in sufficient numbers, it is vital that GP services 
are incentivised to promote and provide this service. Further, the primary health network should play a key role in providing training and development to GPs and general practice nurses in the delivery of health assessments to children. We endorse the First Steps Count Child and Community Centre to be established in Taree in 2022. Stage one construction has been jointly funded by the state government and philanthropic contribution. To meet demand, we call for state government investment in stage two to ensure the full suite of early childhood, maternal child health and family support services can be provided through the centre. We endorse and call for an extension of the Connected Beginnings program in communities where disproportionate numbers of children are vulnerable. The Connected Beginnings program is an integrated early childhood, maternal and child health and family support service operating in schools and selected communities, providing greater access to these respective services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. We call on the state government to invest in research on child and family health service hubs. Specifically, we refer you to the University of New South Wales first 2000 days Kids Connect research program. Following the pilot of an integrated health and social care hub in Rockdale, the university now seek to evaluate the impact and social return on investment of integrated child and family health service hubs in optimising the early identification of developmental vulnerability and supporting unmet psychosocial needs of preschool aged children and their families living in disadvantaged urban and rural communities. We see this research as vital in insisting the state government to make evidence-based decisions on how to most effectively co coordinate and deliver child and family health services to vulnerable communities. We call for increased capacity in Hunter New England local health district funded services to implement strategies outlined in the New South Wales first 2000 days health framework. This is essential if Brighter Beginnings is serious in its objective to co-design opportunities for improved service delivery in ways that best meet needs of children. We call for additional state government investment in Regional Development Australia to facilitate the development of a workforce development strategy for allied health services on the mid coast. This strategy should take into account current and forecasted demand, not just for child and family health services, but aged care, disability and mental health services. So I don't want to interrupt, but I am. Have you got much more to do? No. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. We call for an immediate increase in the number of allied health service providers funded through community health, particularly for children and young people. We emphasise the need for additional paediatric physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, dietics, diabetes education, social work and paediatric psychology services. An example wait time for service provision, speech therapy services for children aged three years up to school entry is up to 13 months, while school aged children with language delay are offered assessment only with restricted support for younger children. We also call for increased permanency for advertised positions through Hunter New England local health districts for nursing and allied health positions as a key strategy to attract and retain allied health and other medical professionals. We call for greater transparency in public funding arrangements for specialist ENT services. And finally, we recommend urgent state government investment in publicly funded specialist ENT services for children that includes capacity for timely assessment and surgical intervention delivered locally. This should include access to emergency on-call ENT services. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive time. Thank you. Uh, Ms Foster, do you have an opening statement? Sorry. Can, yes. I, can I just ask how long is that because I'm just conscious that we've got the time. Um, I'm sharing my daughter's story. It's um, in large writing. Okay, no, no. Okay, well, pl please proceed. I'm just trying table. to make sure. No, no, no. That's fine. Okay. Um, please proceed. So thank you, honourable members, of the, to share my opportunity. Um, sorry, can I start again? That's thank okay, you. <laughs> sorry, I'm very nervous. Um, thank you, honourable members of for this opportunity to share my daughter's story. My daughter, who is nine year, years old, had many complications with her hearing since the age of two. 
It was discovered in 2015 at age two and a half when she attended preschool, where they had um, hearing checks by a Viripi health worker. It showed Melinda had glue ears and to seek um, medical treatment. Melinda struggled with continual sinus congestion and was concerned and I was concerned and confused of what to do and how to help. When my older daughter was getting her before school screening assessment, I, I expressed my concern to the audiologist um, if they could have a look at my younger daughter's hearing, um, which led in an assessment on the spot. The autogram showed that Melinda had moderate hearing loss and um, glue ear in both ears. Um, I got a referral to see the ENT, which added her to the waiting list to see the ENT and John Hunter. I got a referral. Um, while waiting to be contacted, I was concerned of the hearing getting worse as it took a long time. Um, and I asked my local GP to provide a referral to see the Mayo Hospital for a private ENT um, doctor. Mm -hmm. And as I was a young mum, I didn't have the funds and um, didn't have any savings and I knew it would be costly. But in the lead up of uh, waiting for that appointment, I was contacted by the um, private, contacted by John Hunter to get um, my daughter's ad adenoids removed and grommets inserted. Um, only getting my licence, I was nervous to travel to Newcastle and I had to leave at 6am and organise care for my oldest daughter. The doctors were very kind and helped made Melinda feel comfortable. After her grommets fell out in 2017, her hearing problems started again and her, she got glue ear again and had ongoing appointments with Hearing Australia. Um, and we were added to the ENT wait list again. In 2018, Melinda was in year one, aged eight, or age six, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I was contacted by Maitland Hospital where she was due to booked in to get another set of grommets. Melinda attended the learning centre at school as she was falling behind, as she wasn't um, hearing and showing delays in um, sound blending and reading. Mm. In 2020, Melinda had another hearing assessment which showed that she had um, glue ear again and moderate hearing loss and the hearing would fluctuate, so some days were good and some days were, were worse. Mm -hmm. um, in 2001, we were added to the waiting list again where Melinda had to have her adenoids removed again and her grommets inserted. So, as so they that was 2021? Uh, yes, this yep. year. Yep. She just got... She's had three sets. <laughs> no, okay. Um, and most recent event on the 1st of May, Melinda got her ear putty stuck in her ears, um, in one of her ears, and it attached to her eardrum in her grommet. And um, as she puts the ear putty to keep her ears dry for having a bath, I rang John Hunter for advice of what to do, and I was advised to go to Tari Hospital. And I waited for hours with my daughter. Um, she was very nervous of what to do and how they were going to get it out. Once we had seen the doctor, he tried to remove the ear putty and it was just breaking apart. It, um, he was not sure what to do and we were refer referred to John Hunter um, with a letter explaining that we were just recently at Tari Hospital. We, we left early in the morning and arrived at 8am at John Hunter in Newcastle where we see we seen reception and we were placed in the queue to see a triage nurse. Tari Hospital did not advise John Hunter of our arrival and the ENT services were disappointed that we were being sent down there without um, with with a hope to see an ENT. Yeah. Melinda was feeling uncomfortable, scared, tired and hungry, which made the situation hard. The nursing team in Newcastle were, com were wonderful and organised the ENT to come down to have a look. They came up with a plan to get the ear putty out. The ENT specialist was able to remove their emerg in the emergency area under light sedation and had all the right equipment to remove the ear putty and her grommet was still intact. It would be great if we had, um, it would be great if our area were, were able to give this type of support to be able to contact an ENT specialist in time of need and emergency. 
The benefit of having an on-call ENT specialist available in our area would reduce waiting times, travelling costs, provides support and reassurance to many families. Thank you. Mel. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, Ms Foster, for coming along in the first instance, and thank you for sharing that very personal family example with us. That's very good. Now, we've got um, approximately about seven and a half minutes or so for each group uh, around the table. So, we, so yes, yeah, so um, we have opposition, crossbench and government members, but for me to explain that, we'll take another two minutes, which will cut off <laughs> what, uh, what little time we have. So if we just start with uh, opposition, I don't know what's it called. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you for, uh, for coming today, everyone. And Mr. Wood, nice to see you again. I think the last time we met was six or seven years ago. Now, when we, I remember that, in fact, I was shadow health minister at the time, and I came up here to address a rally to improve health care in the region. Correct. Now, in the last seven years, has health care improved or gotten worse in the region? It's gotten worse. It's gotten worse. The only positive thing I can say is we now, we now have an MRI scan, which was uh, thank you to the pressure from our committee on uh, yep. Dr. David Gillespie. So we got a license for that. Um, and that was it. We've got a, a new radiology department uh, and we've also got a new uh, renal dialysis. We had an existing renal dialysis, um, but the money that we got, the grant $20 million, we had a, an existing car park. And this is typical how health is, is spending the money. We had a, literally a perfectly functional car park. So in the wisdom when the money was granted, they knocked the car park down and built another car park with great fanfare. We've got a wonderful car park, it's brand spanking new, and we've got 12 extra parking spots. But since, since then, the question you asked me, has it improved or not? Our, our nurses and doctors do an unbelievable job under the most extreme difficulties. And we commend them. The community see them working. They're short-staffed. The staffing levels are horrendous. For example, in our emergency department, as today, the nurses were outside protesting outside the hospital in their lunchtime so, they wouldn't, so they wouldn't compromise the, um, the uh, patients. In emergency, they're short of 7.1 full-time staff. There's no, there's no full-time FASM. A FASM is a, a fellow of, uh, of the Australian, uh, sorry, of the Australian, uh, sorry, I've lost it. Yes, sorry. Uh, so you need to have a FASM. And we have only got 0.5 for, for two weeks. We've got shortage of staff. We've got a 18 bed emergency department that I was involved in as a nurse and, and in risk management and senior management and from the day one it was open it was clearly stated that it would only be funded for nine beds. Why do we build an 18 bed emergency department and only fund it for nine? So are there only nine at the moment? Only half the beds are... Only half the beds are, are staffed and funded and that's been since it was opened. Um, so we've got shortages of staff. Staff are getting extremely de demoralised. Uh, staff are leaving, which is, is terrible. We can't get staff. And um, we've got the, the, the situation now where we've got cleaners in the emergency department, which I never thought I would ever say, who are sitting with patients who may be confused or demented, and they're sitting with them. Would you, sorry, so cleaners are, cleaners. As, are assisting with dementia? Cleaners. People suffering. Yes, all, uh, they've also been asked on the wards uh, to to actually sit and monitor the dementia patients because we no longer have a 16-bed dementia ward, which was closed without any consultation whatsoever with the community. Now that's impacted in three ways: one, they're sending the dementia patients to the hospital; two, they send them home to the family members who may be in their 80s and quite debilitated themselves and expected to look after the husband, wife, or whatever it may be, or they send them to Tamworth, or they send them to uh, well, uh, Tamworth but, or Newcastle. But Mr. Wood, yes. the population, I understand, is growing. 94,000. So you're almost 100,000 people. 94,000 people. 94,000. 94,000 people. Now this hospital, when I did my nurses training here, 
on the lady who's here today, Mrs. Patra uh, Patricia Mortal, who was manager of nursing services. Our hospital was the leader in education, in initiatives. We were constantly, other hospitals, other health services used our system. Once we joined Hunter New England, we started losing our services. We started losing it, and it was done subtly. We had an eight bed high dependency unit, which was functioning wonderfully well. And all of a sudden, we're not having it anymore. So you're not in the same health district as Coffs and Port Macquarie? No, we're, we're in, in Hunter, New England. You Why think? is that? You think... <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, Walt... I didn't, I didn't mean to make people well, laugh. And, and can, you, can you explain to me why the audience laughed? Why we're in Hunter, New England? No, why they laughed when I asked that question. I, I, I don't really know. <laughs> but, I think you might know. But I will say this, Walt, I think you might know. I will say I this. It is not a laughing matter. No. When you see your hospital and your staff demoralized yep. and leaving, yep. it's, it's atrocious. And it's done subtly. And Hunter, New England, the CEO and all the people will say, oh, yes, you've got plenty of staff. Well, you say that to the staff in the emergency department that they're short of 7.1 full-time positions. Now, you, you said say that to the nurse yep. on the medical ward who's a first-year graduate nurse and is put in charge of the ward. First-year graduate first nurse. First-year graduate nurse. In charge of the emergency. In charge of a ward. Mistakes happen when that occurs. Mistake, but it's unfair to the nurse as well. It's unfair to the patients. But imagine we've got dementia patients who I have the greatest respect. They deserve the same level of care as everybody else, but it is a specialist care. But the cleaners on the ward were asked to monitor and sit or bring back the demented patient. So you may have a poor bedded ward with IV, IDC, you might have everything going. The poor demented patient is going up trying to pull the IV down. It's horrendous. The patients that are in there that are trying to get well can't get sleep, can't rest. It's just atrocious. Now, Mr. Wood, you also mentioned in your opening statement that Manning Base and the region here has the worst cardiovascular rates in regional Australia. Correct. Why is that? Because we haven't got a cardiac, la uh, ca cardiac lab. We've only got one cardiologist, and he's been For 100,000 people. <laughs> he's been pushing for a cardiac lab for years and years and years. There's one set up at the Mayo Private Hospital, but it's but not a non-functioning one. And he, the, uh, the cardiologist has actually pro approached the head of to New England and said, well, why don't we set it up? Why don't we set it up uh, so that we can work with the private hospital and partly fund it with the public? But we are in dire straits here regarding staffing, and it's, it's, it's horrendous. And if I can just give you this one example. I'm yeah. sorry, I know you're busy. Just got to share it That's right. now, please, but done. we had a 34-year-old young lady come to our hospital. She's a qualified paramedic and a qualified registered nurse. Now, our emergency department is 7.1 short. She asked for a, a full-time position. No, we can't give you a full-time position. We can only give you a casual. Now, this lady wants to buy a house, wants to settle down here. We wouldn't offer her a full-time position. We'll give you casual. Well, so we've lost her. She's now actually, which is really sad, has gone completely out of health and is working in a medical center in Port Macquarie doing Botox. Okay. So she would have been ideal for our emergency department. So we, you know, we, we're losing our staff, and if I could put it in a, in a simple analogy, is this. Once upon a time at our hospital, we had a beach ball like that, full of experienced staff. Now, we've got an orange. And I know for the fact, the conversation I had with a gentleman yesterday, two more staff will be leaving from the emergency department. Can I ask, can I ask yes. one last question? What, was the, what were the nurses protesting at noon today? Was it the staffing, Staff. le staffing Staff. levels in staffing. the emergency department? Yes. Thank you. Deputy Chair, I have a Thank you, Chair. Um, Mrs. Uh, Katsamangos, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Sorry about that. Um, you say in your submission that parents are being told that there's a four to six year wait for intervention on hearing issues. Um, I mean, sh I, mean, I mean, that's quite shocking. Surely at that point the child's issues could be a, a much worse. Um, how are parents responding to that or, or what's the reaction in the community?
So if you t take a look at some of the parent stories that are included within the submission, it gives a rather detailed demonstration of how challenging that actually is. Um, for people who can afford to go private, uh, ENT services are readily quite accessible, but anyone who's reliant on the public um, system is being informed of anywhere three years plus uh, for interventions and uh, surgical interventions all need to take place um, either in John Hunter at Maitland or Gosford. So families are incurring costs for travel as well um, and for some families, uh, depending on the type of surgical intervention, they're asked to stay for two weeks within the vicinity of an emergency <coughs> department with an ENT on call. So they can't come back to Taree because that service is not available. So they then need to um, cover the cost of accommodation for you know, up to two weeks to provide that support to their children. So on average, you know, parents seem to be incurring debts of anywhere between four and a half thousand to one of our families anticipating approximately 20,000 um, because their second child has been identified to have issues as well and it's also linked to orthodontic work that will be required. Um, you go on to say um, that there was a generous funding package but the waiting period still exists. I mean, what's happening here? Why hasn't this funding actually helped fix some of those waiting periods? Which funding package are you referring to? I'm just looking at one part of your submission that I pulled out on that quote. It says, despite having access to generous funding packages, extensive waiting <sighs> periods mean that children miss vital hearing, medical and other allied health services in the preschool years. Yes, so when a child um, is identified to have an issue, a, a concern perhaps with hearing, um, often they're re um, referred to the uh, ECEI program, which is for children identified to have um, a barrier, uh, prior to being engaged in the NDIS more generally. And children up to the age of seven don't require a formal diagnosis to access it. So when a child is identified with a hearing issue, they can't afford to um, go down the ENT path. Often the intervention um, in the wait time is a referral to ECEI where they get a funding package uh, where they can get some early intervention in the meantime. The challenge with that is, is if you do get a package and you are referred to speech therapy um, in lieu of uh, the surgery that the child really needs, it's limited in its impact because if the child can't hear, they can't derive the best benefit from speech mm -hmm. therapy. Um, so it's not a it's not a good use um, of funding. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's probably it's a, yeah not not directed in the right way. Mm. Miss um, Foster, thank you so much for mm. sharing your personal story. I know that can be quite daunting and difficult to come and, and share something so personal, so thank you so much. Um, you mentioned that you were on quite a few waiting lists. Uh, how long did you have to sit and wait on those waiting lists and, and what was that period like for you, you and your family? Um, once I've been added to the ENT waiting list, it was um, a waiting list between um, three, for three months and they'll give me a call on a um, cancellation list or when a, a spot comes available. Um, and then, like, one time I only had to wait two weeks, but then um, the first time was I had to wait almost the whole three months where her hearing was very um, bad and she was falling behind in class. And what was that like for her, sort of obviously waiting in limbo for three months? Um, very, like, she was very confused and a lot of people would say that she's deaf and... Um, it was very hard for her and at school she wasn't able to, to hear what the teachers were saying and she, she didn't know what was wrong and, um, and I didn't really know what was happening until, until the doctor explained what the glue ear is. It's like custard in a drum and if you bang it, it's very dull and um, very hard to hear and that's how she's hearing, all muffled sounds and she's still um, in the learnt, learning centre at school where she gets support for um, reading and sound blending and one-on-one um, -on -one support and she's in year four. Mm. Yeah. Hard. Um, Ms Hollingworth, um, you, you mentioned that your private charity um, is having to raise money to buy specialised equipment. Yeah. Um, what sort of equipment are you guys having to, to buy to help support the community? Um, and, uh, and is there other people doing this as well to try to fill those gaps? 
There's another organisation in the area called Can Assist and their focus is on cancer. Mm -hmm. So I can't speak for what they're doing. What we've been buying is uh, uh, sorry, palliative care equipment like special chairs that allow people... One of the things that happens when you're uh, prone for a long time or you're lying and you can't move very much is that you have a risk of pressure sores which can become very complicated. And so people need other ways of sitting, lying, positioning themselves. So we've bought 12 special chairs for the hospital. So everything that we've fundraised for, we've put into the local Hunter New England Health Tari Equipment Service. So it's like a, a lending library of equipment. And some of that in goes into the hospital and some of it goes into people's homes as needed. And that's determined by the nursing personnel or the, special, the palliative care specialist personnel who are looking after the patients and saying they need this. And if they had this, they could go home rather than stay in hospital. So, so, so some of them are rojo cushions, you know, those honeycomb cushions mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. help li lift the person off hard surfaces. Uh, we've done chairs, we've done lifters, we've, you know, it's a, it's a, a range of things. Something about $75,000 worth of equipment over time. And, and, and why we do that is that mm -hmm. you can't get the funding out of the government system fast enough for the people to have the equipment. So that also occurs with when we pay for people to have personal care services at home, the person will die before they get the help. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and for a community to have to, to, to fund its own palliative care or other types of care, transport or whatever it is, it's it just it's very difficult and not everybody can have that level of care and you said that you're also fundraising from an already impoverished community yeah. so there's obviously an upper limit to what you can even achieve if, yeah. if there's gaps happening and of course in the last year or so in fact in the last two years we've had bushfires covid floods so the, com the capacity of the community to actually contribute anything is very we've stopped fundraising out of consideration for the people in the community and yet we're just running our our uh, funding program are out of reserves. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I just think I'll go to you first, Ms. Katsamangos. Thank you um, for attending today as well as Ms. Bodstar. Just, I must admit, reading the uh, submission from your organisation, it was pretty shocking to think that here in New South Wales, in the public health system, we have children seriously waiting between four and six years to be able to get a tonsillectomy. Is that not at, oh, surgery? Well, not, no, it's usually ENT related. So we're looking at things like um, grommets and adenoids and Grommet that type and of sur surgical intervention. Some of, the, some of the submissions, some of the case studies that you said as well in terms of kids who are clearly having extreme difficulties with hearing having to wait three years or more. Mm. So you also say in your submission, you point out the New South Wales government's goal, if you like, in terms of brighter beginnings. Yeah. And you say that the government is saying that they want to make sure children are developmentally on track. They're committed to giving every child in New South Wales the best start in life. And they want to make sure that children can participate in terms of you know, having lifetime health education and social and economic benefits that schools can bring. Mm. Do you think the government in this area is doing that for the children of Manning Great Lakes? No. Compared to the rest of New South Wales, do you feel like you're being left behind? Do you feel like you're being treated as second class citizens? Um, I, don't, I don't think I'd go to saying second class citizens, but I would it really is a question about accessibility. So it's about children being able to access the services they need in, air, in a location in which they're comfortable to do so in a manner that is timely and that any intervention that is required can be delivered locally and is affordable. And that is not happening at the moment. So as I've said in my, in my submission, you know, there are areas, um, there are examples of great service delivery, but overall the, the system is fragmented. 
We support um, the, the government's Brighter Beginnings initiative. We support the first 2,000 days uh, health framework. Um, but generally our conclusion is that while the principles are good, the resources are not behind it, which makes it incredibly challenging. So for us, when we want to work with our local hospital, with our local healthcare providers, to form the types of partnerships that they want us to form in order to deliver better services, there's not enough flexibility within the staffing to enable that to occur. We need people within the hospital to be able to come into the community services sector to help us identify and name the problem, to help us form solutions, but the flexibility is not there. So we really, we sit on the sidelines trying to pull the bits of information that we need and it takes far too long. Um, so we need greater capacity in the health system itself to be able to develop the kind of partnerships that the government says that it wants. With, um, you're talking about partnerships, but with something like parents being currently advised of wait times anywhere between four and six years, mm. that really comes down to funding within the public health system, doesn't it? If with we've that got particular children, issue, yes. yes. Yes, children and parents who have private health who can afford to, yes. to, to go down that path, that's fine for them, yes. but you are specifically yes. highlighting the people who can't afford the private health system as much and the public health system is, is three to four to Yes, yes, and Mel's um, experience is reflective of the fact that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are actually better off in this area in terms of accessing ENT services. They have a visiting ENT around every six weeks to the Biripai Aboriginal um, Medical Corporation, and, but if they need surgical intervention, they still need to travel. So that, that issue remains. Thank you, um, Ms Hollingsworth. Thank you for the great work that your organisation has done um, and all of the members of your organisation for doing so much fundraising uh, and filling a obviously a much needed um, gap. What would be happening to the uh, patients in um, this area if your organisation was not able to raise the funds and provide the services and resources that you have been able to provide? Uh, in some cases, just to go back to the question about equipment, I was just remembering that we've bought mini oxygen concentrators, for example, and supplied them, put them into it. So that means that somebody can actually go out of a hospital for a while or go home and have breathing support. They don't have to be attached to stationary equipment all the time. So what would be happening is that people would just be living it harder. So the people at home who care for them uh, have more... Um, burdensome work to do. You've got somebody who can't breathe at home or you can't, you can't manage to shower or do the home care yourself. So if nobody else comes in and does that, then you've got a hygiene problem and, and exacerbating health problems. So the whole quality of life thing deteriorates for people. Do you, is, there a sense that, is there a sense that the government might also rely sometimes on the community fundraising and filling the gaps because if, as you said, if you weren't yeah. doing it, not that you well, should stop fundraising for the <laughs> community, but it is a double-edged sword, isn't it? Yeah, look, we're facing a, a, a difficulty ourselves. We may have to because we're an ageing population, the people that are in this organisation, and for various reasons people can't go on doing the work and we're having difficulty finding people with the capability and capacity to pick up the organisation and keep it going. So there's one part of it. So I don't know if we can keep doing it. Of course, if the problem is solved, well, the people that we're supporting very often are not always um, able to advocate well for themselves. How this works, this partnership with the community works, is the nurses in the community and in the hospital tell us when there are people who are in acute difficulty and say to us, if w would you... We think these people need X, Y, and Z services. Would you pay the bills? And we agree to pay the bills, and they arrange them. The bills come through to us, and we pay. So we're not a frontline organisation. We're working in partnership with the care community. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Across the government members, just trying to squeeze the time in to make sure everyone gets a fair shake. So, sure. government members. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much for all appearing today. Um, I'll start with uh, Ms Jenkins and Ms Hollingworth. Um, thank you both for appearing today. And uh, I know the palliative care space is particularly um, 
uh, challenging, um, but it's also uh, rewarding when you know that you've made a difference in people's um, lives or their end of life, and I think that's that's really important. Um, are you able to tell me about um, any, I guess, recent um, uh, changes in, in the palliative care space around um, this area? Um, has there been any um, updates that you mm. might be able to advise on? So um, you'll probably see from our submission, which we made a couple of years ago to Hunter New England Health, that one of our main lines of ag advocacy was to get more palliative care specialist personnel into the area, allied health as well as n clinical staff. And the main a wish was to have a palliative care specialist. So we've actually managed to achieve half a palliative care specialist. Yeah. So, but in a, in a population of 95,000, soon rapidly going to 100,000, the standard is 1.5 for a population that size. Aaron Beltre is the palliative care specialist who's here now, and um, he makes an enormous difference in the work that he does. He's got phenomenal energy, and he's um, doing a whole lot in the hospital environment, but also makes himself available to come and work with us to say, how can we bring life back into this? How can we find people to pick it up and take it on? So that makes a huge difference to the morale of the whole community of people like us, a community, the community organisation, the carers themselves, the practitioners, they've got somebody they can go to, the GPs can speak to somebody who's a specialist in this area and, and cover off things that they're uncertain about. Uh, and, the, and the peers and colleagues in the hospital now have somebody that they can put those really tricky life-death questions to. Yeah which was not available before. Yeah. Yeah. And um, have you, uh, I, I, I guess, had uh, an opportunity to uh, have those conversations with him and, and um, I guess, uh, provide some um, support and feedback and, and uh, collaborate on, on um, how you're b best able to assist each other in, in the work that you do? Yeah, that's underway. His, per his position's only been permanent since the beginning of this year. And so we're having conversations about what can we do as a community organisation now that he's here? It changes the direction. We, don't, we would like, obviously, we'd go on advocating for another one, one whole palliative care specialist person. But also the allied health area, as the others have been saying, is really under-resourced. And it's quite often the occupational therapists and the physiotherapists and the social workers in this area mm. People so desperately need support, and how do I deal with the practicality of what we are living with? Yeah. And well, um, yeah. 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 I just wanted to say, um, you know, well done on, on your advocacy, and, and you know, I know that, um, that that he's going to make a, a you know a huge difference in, in, in uh, this area. So well, well done for that. Thank you. Very uh, much. Mr. Wood, I just wanted to um, uh, turn to you quickly. Now, um, looking at the uh, the questioning that the Honourable Walt Secord um, put to you around. Um, the, I guess the structure of the, the health network here and, and the fact that you are with Hunter New England, um, can you just talk me through what you see as some of the difficulties in being involved with the Hunter New England network? Most definitely. Um, since we joined Hunter New England, our hospital started to, first of all, lost its identity. Yep. Then we started losing funding. Mm -hmm. We were treated, how can I put it, as the small hospital. Yep. We've got Port Macquarie, and then you've got John Hunter. Yep. Um, we as a base hospital used to deal with trauma mm -hmm. and what we couldn't handle with by, or by helicopter or by ambulance. Mm -hmm. Each year since we've been with Hunter New, uh, Hunter New England, the services have diminished. Right. There's been increasing pressure, and this is a, a real factor. There's been in increasing pressure from senior management, and I'm sure that the government put pressure on the senior management that's passed all the way down through to general managers, managers of nursing services, managers of non-clinical services, to cut costs. And that's constant. I worked with a manager, a general manager at Manning Bay's Hospital for 10 years. Mm. He was excellent. And this is a, an example. He came to us one day and he said, I've been asked to cut the cost by 15%. Oh, mm -hmm. The following year, he said, I've got to cut costs by... He said, I can't do it. Now, we had that general manager for 10 years. And in the end, he left. He said, I just can't do it. And that impacts on everything. It impacts on the infrastructure of the yeah. hospital. It impacts on the education programs of the hospital. It, on, it impacts on how we attract specialists and nurses to come to our hospital 
not only to come to our hospital, but to keep them. And we have an enormous problem. For example, we got five fasens in our emergency department. Yep. They only lasted a short time. Once yeah. better positions come up for somewhere else, they left. They felt they weren't supported. I, I know we're running out of time and that, that obviously we've no, got... No, no, um, no, no, but no. I just wanted to ask a couple more questions. Yes. Um, uh, so so you, you don't feel that it was appropriate that, that, that Tari was put in with um, Hunter New England? Is that sort of where I, I guess you're... Well, we treated differently. Completely okay. different. We had all our systems. And it was, well, we, this is how we do it in Newcastle. Yeah. And, sorry, can I just ask, when you said the general manager had done it for, you know, about a decade, I think. <coughs> so, do you know, when, when, was the, 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 when was Tari incorporated with Hunter About 15 England? years ago we went to... Oh, 15 years ago? Yeah, about oh, okay, 15 so years ago. Yes. It was quite a while ago. Yes, it was. Oh, and okay. each year it's diminished. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, so, you'd be advocating for, then, uh, I guess, a change to the to the system, like the, the way that, um, that you're allocated to it, you'd be looking to be allocated to a different um, network, is that what you'd be looking to do or? Is that what we feel as a community we'd like? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to gauge what it is that you feel the solution is because um, well, obviously we, we write recommendations to, yes. and, and so what is it that, that, that you think is the appropriate fix for this. Well, if we, if we did go, say for instance, to the Mid-North Coast, which yep. is Cops Harbour, and I used to service all those hospitals, yep. we'd have to go with fur equity to be treated responsibly and treated as a hospital that we are, but to bring us up to an acute care level. Now, yep. Professor Baloff clearly stated that this hospital, who is highly respected, Austra not only here in Australia-wide, that our hospitals should be brought up to an acute care standard yep. and funded and staffed at that level. Okay. We're not now. Okay. We're not. And so, you know, the community expect, they don't expect five-star treatment, but they're entitled to have fur treatment. And yep. the young lady at the end, when she talked about a, a, a son with a, a ear problem, yeah. education-wise, not having an ENT, that public patients can go to will infect those children, little boys, little girls, with the learning process and can affect them longer term as they get older. And so, do you know, 15 years ago when there was the incorporated... Uh, yes. Was, did, was, there, was there a case made at the time to the government of the day to say that this shouldn't happen? No, basically what happened was uh, they were changing the boundaries and the question was asked, uh, sh should we move Manning Hospital to Hunter, New England? And one of our orthopaedic surgeons said, it'd be wonderful if we went with Hunter New England mm -hmm. because then we could have access to the specialists in John Hunter. Mm -hmm. And that carried a lot of weight and we went across. Right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, listen, I've given a bit of latitude because of the... Uh, Sorry? I've given a bit of latitude with the time because of the quality of the evidence from yourselves has been very, very good evidence. But unfortunately, we will have to draw a line under it. Um, now, I think... Um, there, Ms. Clangwood, there was a, a, a document that was going to be an additional document we're going to provide to us, is that? Yeah, um, it was, so, yeah. if the Secretary could, um, if they've not obtained that, obtain that. And I'm wondering, Ms. Foster, with your opening statement, would we be able to get a copy of that because we'll give it to Hansard and that will help them with the transcription. Uh, and to just confirm, before we got underway, um, I've got a single page document which has got Manning Valley uh, push for palliative. Uh, I've got a copy of that. Yeah. Um, Mr Wood, I've got a, a rather detailed document, I think, standing in your name, which we'll have access to. And Midcoast uh, uh, for Kids, we've got a further document from yourselves. So, from your original submissions to your very quality contributions today through your oral evidence and the additional material you provided, you've given us a, a wealth of information. I'm sure we'll enrich our inquiry very much. So, thank you all very much and uh, we'll move on to the next uh, group of witnesses. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Is it possible for me to just say one thing, please? Yes. I know you're busy. Uh, I'm sorry about this, but we've gone through floods, drought, floods, COVID, and now yep. we're in a situation where our health service is in crisis. Right. There's no two ways about it. No matter which way you look at it, we're in a crisis situation, irrespective of what the politicians say or the health service say, we are in a crisis situation. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you to all the witnesses. Um, we've got our next panel. Um, Dr. Roberts, uh, Dr. Holliday, and uh, Dr. Narishaham. But thank you. Uh, yes. uh, we'll pull this back in as much as we can. Just, uh, try to so, so you want me to stand? Where are we? So it's just gone four, so... Um, yeah, so we'll do that if that's okay. Yeah, yes, that'd be great. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, we'll get underway through dealing with the formalities first. Um, so what I'll do is, um, from my left, uh, Dr Roberts, uh, get, get each of you to identify yourself by name. Uh, your, your position title, if you are representing an organisation today, if you're appearing in your capacity as a, as a private citizen, that should be separately identified, uh, and then take either the oath or the affirmation, affirmation, whichever you prefer, the words of both uh, would be before you. So, starting with Dr. Roberts. Uh, my name is Nigel Roberts. I'm um, here as a private individual, but I am Director of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at Manning Hospital. And I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Holliday. And once again, apologies for not having the line of sight. I've got this uh, no, machine in the middle, so, yeah. My name's Simon Holliday. Thank you. Uh, I've been a doctor in this area for 25 years. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much. And Dr. Narashnaham, is, is that pronounced correct, Doctor? It's Naras Simon, but thank that's you. fine. That's, I'm thank used you, Doctor. To it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm the acute care physician and the cardiologist who lives and works in the Manning Valley in the Great Lakes. Thank you. Uh, I work in the Manning Base Hospital. Thank you. And I take the affirmation that I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, now... Can I just acknowledge uh, uh, all your respective submissions which have been received by the inquiry and been processed, uh, have in, been entered as evidence and, uh, and have been uploaded to the uh, inquiry web page. So Dr Roberts, uh, your submission is number six to the inquiry. Uh, Dr uh, Holliday, yours is uh, submission 379. And Dr Narashnam, uh, yours is uh, uh, number 168. Now, with respect to those submissions, um, you can take them as all read uh, by the committee members. Um, so with respect to, I'm about to invite you to make an opening statement, there's no need to go through what the content is in any detail, but perhaps rather some broad comments to set up what we'd like to do, and that is some questioning of yourselves about the content of your submissions and matters arising from that. So if you're a group with that, doctors, is that satisfactory to you all? We'll start then with you, Dr Roberts. Just an opening statement, please. As reflected in Mel's testimony earlier, I believe that pe people of regional and rural New South Wales are disadvantaged by a lack of public outpatient services. 
Manning Hospital does not have the infrastructure nor the personnel required to run outpatient clinics efficiently. Because regional hospitals are largely staffed by VMOs who, who generally run clinics in their private rooms but not the hospital, regional residents of New South Wales are forced to pay for the same care that their city cousins enjoy for free or they have to travel hundreds of kilometres for that care or worst of all they go, out, go without the care altogether. The problem is not with the VMOs, it is due to a failure to attract staff specialists to regional hospitals. It is with regional hospitals that do not employ VMOs to run publicly funded clinics on a sessional basis. Now there are numerous negative consequences of this imbalance of VMOs and staff specialists. As I said, there's a lack of publicly funded clinics to which rural residents can attend. Further, doctors in training do not receive the training that they require in outpatient care because it doesn't occur within the hospital. And they don't receive adequate day-to-day -day supervision and support. Furthermore, there is a lack of governance mechanisms to ensure that the right procedure is being performed on the right patient or that complications are adequately investigated and steps taken to prevent their recurrence. And finally, the VMO model can encourage over-servicing. It doesn't always, but it can, and I have seen this occur. In 2018, I reviewed over 200 women who came forward to express concerns over their care at Manning Hospital under the care of one particular doctor. It was evidence that a doctor there had been performing unsafe operations and unnecessary operations, which in my opinion at time reached fraudulent levels. However, he operated unfettered within the health system for some 16 years, despite multiple horrific complications that went unreported or were not investigated at all. Now, as stated by Gail Finesse in her independent report requiring surgical complications by this doctor, they, the patients often returned to his private rooms and some were encouraged not to attend Manning Hospital after the complications arose. She goes on to say, there was no evidence available to me that before the arrival of Dr Roberts, there was any reviews of the IMS undertaken to enable any pattern to be detected or reviews followed up. And she continues, it is no coincidence that IMS reports and other complaints escalated from mid-2015. There were discussions among colleagues and no reporting because there was no one to report to. As I said, the problem was not with VMOs. It, was a, it, it is with an unbalanced system which fails to attract staff specialists to regional areas. It is with regional hospitals that do not recruit staff specialists in the roles of director, so that someone with the expertise in the relevant specialist area has dedicated paid time to ensure that excellent standards of care are met and maintained. A director represents a role, it's not just a title. Now if we are to aim and achieve excellence in our healthcare rather than just throw the term around as management speak, then we need to invest in the medical leadership of our regional hospitals. We need to incentivise working as a staff specialist in regional hospitals and we need to stop wasting money on unnecessary procedures. If we do any less than what is required to fix the system, it's a rebuke to those 200 brave women who came forward to tell us of their injuries and it is an ongoing disservice to the people of regional New South Wales who pay their taxes just like their city cousins. Uh, thank you Dr Roberts for that uh, very comprehensive opening statement. Uh, can I invite you Dr Holliday if you'd like to make an opening statement. Thank you. <coughs> I'm a GP, I'm an addiction physician. I'm a past GP anaesthetist and GP obstetrician and I'm currently in both private practice and in hospital practice as a staff specialist here in drug and alcohol. In Houston we have got a problem and the problem I'd like to talk to you about is workforce. When I was looking to come to this area um, I looked around a number of rural practices as a, G as a GP proceduralist and every single one around New South Wales wanted to charge goodwill, sometimes up to $65,000 to join a practice. But now the tables are turned. We have to pay recruitment agents, sometimes $28,000 to get a, a doctor, plus promise them the earth. And even then we can't get doctors to come. I was speaking to the owner of a recruitment agency in the last month, and she told me her company has about a thousand GP vacancies on their books. 
I think it's a national company, and they can only they place about 20 to 30 a month. And she's got to the point where they actually refuse to accept practices that are trying to get uh, vacancies advertised through their agency uh, because they're wasting their time trying to get them filled. You and this committee have a very tough job, and I don't envy you because there are a lot of inquiries, there are a lot of requests for your attention, a lot of ways of looking things, a lot of complexities. But today you've heard about the pain and anguish in our community as in many other regional communities. And you have the weight of our expectations on your shoulders to look at the whole health system, not just in a blinkered uh, or uh, you know, a fashion with electoral advantage. And I hope four proposals I make to you today could help you improve our health outcomes. First of all, research. I think we need to facilitate clinicians researching and I think we need to also evaluate policy. And a failure to do that will mean that we don't identify best practice and policy. We need to improve recruitment, especially rurally. Less than 5% of Australian trained doctors choose to practice rurally. This is a disaster. To fill the void, we, have, we seek international medical graduates. And they endure a horrific time, months and years of Kafkaesque barriers and multiple fees. It's an it's a awful marathon. There are at least half a dozen federal and state agencies all not talking to each other and, and making life hell for the international medical graduates and for those uh, people in rural areas trying to get them to come on board. Your committee must look to ensure these bodies coordinate. Without this, the health system enters a state of functional stupidity where competent bureaucrats work in a blinkered, piecemeal fashion, creating an incompetent whole. My third suggestion is you need to facilitate retention. A lot of the doctors around here are burnt out. One senior GP in town recently uh, had to stop working very suddenly, and I was just speaking this afternoon to an owner of a large practice who said, I'm just so burnt out, I'm going to have three months without seeing patients. Rural GPs earn no more than their urban colleagues. And payroll tax is destroying our viability. It's important for this committee to recommend to Services New South Wales that you drop payroll tax on rural medical practices, especially practices that are employing GP registrars to encourage them to come to the bush. Revenue in New South Wales recently dropped it for Qantas, and you need to do it for medical practices on the same grounds of public interest. Rural uh, public hospitals need to stop ignoring GPs. You need to start, we need to start collaborating better. We need to stop de-skilling GPs, undermining them with competing outpatient services. Rural GPs must not be regarded as gatekeepers. I don't think there's any evidence that outside tertiary referral centres only specialists should provide hospital and outpatient services. Well-trained GP proceduralists or rural generalists can deliver much or even most of the services in their area in a competent fashion. And such a lower cost and accessible model of care may re help reverse some of the deterioration of our health services. Uh, thank you, Doctor, very much. And can I just acknowledge the, uh, the length and the quality of your submission, which was very, very detailed. It's appreciated very much by the committee. Uh, Doctor, would you like to make an opening statement? Um, and please thank take. you. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. I would like to thank this committee for this opportunity to tell our story of the Manning. I come here with the support of my physician colleagues at the Manning Hospital. There is agreement amongst all health practitioners that urgent steps are required to address the understaffing and the inadequate facilities within the Manning Hospital. The Department of Medicine have identified these issues and we have provided solutions to address them in our submission 168. I believe these problems stem from a disconnect between decision makers 
and local stakeholders providing services. I would like to highlight pertinent problems for further discussion later. They are chronic inadequate funding and downgrading of facilities and services, centralized decision-making process that disadvantages those providing the care, the failure to provide contemporary facilities, infrastructure, thereby not allowing health practitioners to provide standards of care as expected by New South Wales Health. We have challenges in attracting and retaining suitably qualified staff. Nobody wants to come here. Chronic underfunding means we have an exhausted and a severely downgraded hospital. We have lost CCU beds. It's not an appealing hospital for new recruits. We are hemorrhaging qualified and experienced allied health practitioners. I'm the first and the currently the only cardiologist living and working in the Manning. The heart of the inequality study, which was done by the government, has shown that the federal state of line has the worst cardiovascular outcomes in regional Australia. This automatically explains why I have an extraordinarily large workload with major responsibilities. I constantly work 80 hours a week at the bare minimum to provide 24-7 care for my patients. The natural disasters, as well explained, have further highlighted the issues of not having local facilities to support our community. The roads were cut off, planes couldn't land here, and this could always happen again. The Manning has the oldest age demographic in Australia. People are living longer, which means they have more complex, chronic, multiple medical problems which make management of these patients complex, leading to longer length of hospitalization. We have high levels of socio-economic disadvantaged patients, a large indigenous community which have their own requirements which are appropriate and should be respected. All these factors in combination make the needs for this region complex and dictate a higher level of service provision. Pro provision of contemporary medical care requires better funding, up-to-date infrastructure, as without these appropriate resources, it is impossible to provide this care to our community and patients and address what New South Wales Health expects us practitioners to provide. COVID has educated all of us on various issues. One issue is the population expansion in regional Australia. Many Australians are moving out of the metros to coming to regional areas. In general, 40% of Australians live in regional Australia. This is why I left my university job in New York City and I've moved here and I'm very happy to do so. We have to provide the same level of care to these people as those in Sydney and Melbourne and other metros. There are more than 250 entire and surrounding areas, one, more than 150 in Harrington, and these developments are experiencing a high level of pre-sales. This implies approximately 400 new families are exploding into this region and this hospital will not be able to cope. The latest figures indicate that the Manning has a 10% higher level of residents over the age of 55. By implication, it means 10,000 additional people in the higher care needs bracket are living in this region. This hospital was not capable of supporting them. The bare minimum the hospital needs is an acute assessment unit, cardiology services including an updated CCU, a cath lab to provide and treat locals locally, a delirium unit because it is repugnant allowing our elderly to travel far away outside this region, a respiratory assessment unit including a sleep unit and an updated ICU. The current ICU works far more than what it's funded for and as my colleagues and others have mentioned, there is true burnout. So the Department of Medicine will invest a lot of time and passion in preparing this clinical services plan which you all have to advocate for the service improvement in the Manning Hospital. And we have tabulated into a short, intermediate and a long term in a concise form. There are cost neutral solutions provided which may actually save resources in the long term. Unfortunately, there is no feedback, there is no transparency, there is no update. And a response of it's confidential in when we ask what is the accepted 
updated, submitted clinical services plan does not foster a good working relationship between the medical workforce and the administration. I look forward to having further discussion in the Q&A session. Thank you, Doctor. And um, uh, can, can I also um, acknowledge your submission and the content and detail? Thank you very much. Well, we'll move now to questioning, uh, and we'll share it between the groups represented here, which are uh, opposition, government, and crossbench members. So, we'll start with the government. Would government members like to kick off with the questions? Um, yes. Um, sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for. Uh, appearing today, and um, uh, Dr. Holliday, I want to start with you first, and, and uh, looking at some of the uh, the workforce issues, uh, I guess. And um, you provided to us in your opening statement and your submission some ideas around what it is you think uh, can be done to to start addressing it. And you know, obviously, there's uh, issues like taxation, um, issues uh, like remuneration, like. Um, can you expand on a few of those and? Um, just provide some insights into how the dynamic has changed in the in the past 20 or so years. Because I noted you talked about um, what it was like when you came and you know having to pay goodwill uh, to join a practice, as to now finding it hard to attract people, and how that's changed, and and what's changed, and what can be done to return it back to I guess uh, a a more an equilibrium of where we want to be. Sure. Look. Um I think if I had to choose two points, it would be one, um, the various uh, authorities responsible for healthcare regulation need to talk to make sure it works. Because at the moment there's no talk, it's dislocated and because there's no coordination, it's a disaster. And a very simple thing of just trying to look at the pathway that people could enter the workforce or um, or remain in the workforce or leave the workforce and getting the different stakeholders uh, to make sure this works better would be a, something doable. I mean, there are the issues of state and federal um, contests, but that's a good start. The second thing I think is really important that we need to make sure Australian trained doctors come to rural areas. Now. Um, I did speak to uh, one of our local politicians who told me that the AMA would not allow medical conscription. I think that's passing the buck and I think um, we already have a form of conscription and international medical graduates are required to come to rural areas. Um, so what's good for the goose is good for the gander and I think that Australian taxpayers, rurally and urban, pay tax to develop wonderful universities and wonderful curriculums and wonderfully culturally appropriate training for our doctors with the skills and the interpersonal and um, social cultural um, skills that they need to be to deliver great health care. And I think that rural people should access uh, such um, a product of our um, system. In the meantime, um, we are um, reliant on international medical graduates. And I think something like 35% of the medical workforce is now international medical graduates. And I think we've got to make, we've got to look after them because they have a hell of a time. It's a disaster. If you read my submission, you'll see reports about marriages breaking down and uh, it has been very, very difficult. It's um, the way that international medical graduates are treated like cannon fodder, really, for uh, the fact that we do not provide for our rural communities from our own medical graduates. So we take um, medical graduates who are very expensive to train from, often from developing countries. And I, don't, and I think it's like a reverse foreign aid. I think we should be not relying on international medical graduates, even though they have most of my colleagues are, and I have a wonderful relationship and great respect for them. But I do think that we need to say Australia needs to start providing its Australian trained workforce for rural areas. I could go on, but... And so if we're able to supply, uh, say, our own organic workforce, um, 
with Australian trained doctors only, how do you think we're best able to uh, attract those doctors to places like the Manning Valley um, over, uh, say, a metropolitan area? We know uh, that the quality that, that you get, you know, quality of life you get living in an area like this. Um, but how do we impart that to, to those new training doctors to, to make them to want to come here and actually set up their life and their practice? And that's a great question. Um, be, and um, you've got to look at the doctor and you have to look at the spouse or the partner and the family as well mm -hmm. because they come together. Um, with, in terms of medical training, I think we do have to make more medical graduates think about general practice and rural generalism, I think, is um, uh, dying out, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And I think it's a perfect solution for rural areas. I've worked in um, Condoblin, Singleton, um, um, Perisher Valley, uh, Lake Cajelico, Hay, yep. uh, Dorigo, all around the place. And in all, uh, except for Perisher Valley, all those places I worked in, um, hosp ran hospitals as well. And if, if GPs have got appropriate procedural skills, they can look after emergency ward trauma, they can do maybe surgery, maybe anaesthetics, uh, take an x-rays, you know, we look after many, mo most of the inpatients we've had. Rural generalism, we run on a smell of a royal rag. We used to do um, anaesthetics for tonsillectomies for, you know, a quarter or a fifth of what a specialist would command in the public system. Yeah. So from, I don't know why, there's not been a... Um, uh, an experiment to see that this is inferior. No, this is just a cultural change. And I think it's to do with power and the fact that um, colleges and pe people look at specialisation. It's very hard to support moderates in a shooting war and it's hard to s support generalists. I guess that led to... Uh, well, yeah, sure. Dr Holliday, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the proposition point, but, but I'm, I'm interested as to whether my perception that particularly younger GPs, are uh, less enthusiastic about providing the procedural care that you're enthusiastic about, um, whether, they're, whether it's paediatrics or anaesthetics or the like. Is my perception wrong or are, are the GPs that are linking into the system now um, taking a, a, a much uh, more confined role than, than GPs of say, my age would have, uh, would have done 20, 30, 40 years ago? Yeah, look, of course there are cultural changes and, and people also looking at lifestyle. They say, what's the best lifestyle for me and my partner and my kids, best schools, the best jobs, you know, and, and often a uh, lifestyle where you're up in labour ward all night is not really that attractive to some people. Uh, so there is a cultural change. I think also all the levers are going in a different direction. When you're doing your hospital training, you know, GPs are sort of out there, no man's land, and and everybody's looking at specialty pr um, uh, progress, and the ones who fail seem to go to general practice, yeah. and there's that yeah. cultural change. I do think we need to rewrite that, and if we don't rewrite it, rural communities will suffer because they won't be getting accessible, uh, competent medical practitioners. We can't have every specialist represented in every district general hospital. I just have one final question, and it's to Dr. Roberts. It, 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 I, I, I might be wrong, but I suspect there's a degree of tension in terms of how Dr. Roberts sees um, hospital staffing goes to perhaps how Mr. Holiday goes, but that's, a, that's just maybe my perception. But could I ask just in regards to the gay matter, and I know you haven't referred to the name, but it's in your submission, there was what I think is called a, a, a 122 inquiry. Is that what it's called? It was what Hunter New England imposed, in a sense, in the inquiry. There were four fact inquiries. I believe one of them was a one two two. Yeah. Right. So uh, my understanding is there was a series of recommendations that, that came out of uh, the one two two inquiry, which are, um, which are, in a sense, obligatory to be uh, um, carried through on. Can you identify what those, those um, findings were and whether they have satisfied some of the concerns that you had and have that arose out of the gate matter? Uh, no, they don't satisfy me at all. Right. 
I, that I, answers I that I saw the it? 200 women. I, I wrote a report on each of them. I wrote a letter to the GP. I was then asked to come up with overall themes and suggestions, which I did. And then um, they were essentially ignored and a different report was written, the one you're referring to. And there's a little acknowledgement on the end of that one saying that I can find that for you if you like. Sure. Doctor, just having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Sorry. You just please close yep, sorry. It's not your fault, it's the no, no, nature no, of these, the, uh, these microphones. No, no, please proceed. Okay, the steering group acknowledges the significant work completed by the Director of Obstetrics and Gynaecology Manning Hospital as part of the various lookbacks and thank him for a commitment to the patient safety and women of Manning. In conjunction with this document, a clinical report consolidating individual patients' care was undertaken by the director. The clinical report has been provided with this document. There are additional recommendations in the clinical report from the director of obstetrics and gynaecology, Manning Hospital, which were outside the scope or jurisdiction of this look-back investigation. The GAID steering group acknowledges re recommendations and the director's disappointment that they are not included in this report. So essentially I wrote a list of recommendations and those recommendations were summarised and then sent for a vote to the other committee members who were directors of communications and human relations and legal representatives and, and governance officials who ignored the initial request for a look back two years earlier. So no, I'm not satisfied. No, well, I suppose I'm, I, I'm asking this. There were some findings made in the 122 inquiry, which... Is this Gail Finesse's inquiry? Yes, yes. Oh, Gail Finesse's. Oh, well, that's separate to mine. Yeah, no, I, I, I think she that. came up with three recommendations that were rather um, woolly, in my opinion. Sorry, rather... Were, were a little bit vague, not, not very specific, but, right. but three three recommendations that really didn't... Um, help fix the problem, I believe, in a practical sense, what we need are practical changes and solutions. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr Roberts, I'm interested um, for you to elaborate a bit more. In, in your submission you talk about, and I, I'm summarising, um, the, the challenges of BMO models, and I'd be interested to hear your views as to what you say are the challenges and uh, potential solutions, and then to hear from other doctors here as well in relation to that. So the challenges of a VM, of, of a pure VMO. VMO model. Yes, yeah. Okay, so for instance, until I think, until late last year, um, Port Macquarie and Coffs Harbour had a, a pure VMO model. So there are no gynaecology outpatients for public, public patients. So essentially they were sending, I was receiving a lot of referrals for colposcopy, for example which is a, a follow-up for an abnormal pap smear, but a check if someone's got cancer of the cervix. So people in the Port Macquarie and Coffs district either had to travel hundreds of kilometres to get that care or go without or pay uh, somewhere in the range of $400, $500. And, and we're talking about pensioners who might have to have this test done every year under the new guidelines. So it's not the fault of the VMOs because the VMOs could be paid at a sessional rate at, the ho at, a, at a hospital. Um, and Simon would probably be pleased to know, one of the um, registrars I taught in Queensland, I met at a conference lately, he's a GP, but he actually does the colposcopies in, in regional areas in Queensland, which is a great model. And it's free and it's publicly funded. Um, my problem is that there are publicly funded clinics for the people of New South Wales and regional rural areas. Uh, do any of either doctors want to comment further on the VMO model here? Um, suffice to say, whichever way you go, there are problems. Um, I've worked in Britain where everybody is salaried and a lot of the consultants barely bothered to come into the operating theatres during their sessions because they were paid the same way they came or didn't. And I've seen VMOs, I've seen um, fee-for-service medical practitioners do exactly the opposite and 
just uh, basically go for it uh, in an excessive fashion. Look, there are pros and cons of every system. I've been a VMO and I've been a staff specialist. Uh, I don't think it's made too much difference the way I've practised and I've had registrars in both capacities. Um, I, I don't think it's black and white. Um, final question um, is, uh, we've been given additional documents just before um, uh, in relation, I think they're, uh, what are the, BHI, um, Bureau, of, uh, the Bureau of Health Information. Now I've noticed that it's a, a almost 10 years old, the data. Do you have anything more, rel like, uh, more recent? So first I think all of you should call me Dr. Sesh, like everybody in the region does, it's easy. So I, I feel your pain. Um, so all the evidence which we have, which I've submitted and tabled, is what we have up to date. The heart of inequality report has overshadowed this, where it's clearly stated that the worst cardiovascular outcomes in regional Australia is in the federal state of line. So we live and work in the federal state of line. And... Uh, the evidence what we have submitted is 10 years old, correct, 2012 and 2015, but there's none up to date because the population is getting old. Heart disease is an old person's game once you're over the age 60 and above. There are certain ethnicities in the world which have far earlier onset of heart disease. So the subcontinents, like myself, I only have baldness, I'm okay, uh, are, are particularly at high risk. We beat the Aboriginals gold, silver and bronze in terms of early onset heart disease. And we have a regional, re reasonable size of both communities living in the Manning. So um, the BHI doc, and I don't think it's going to get any better because the population is aging, the population is expanding, and by principles of uh, common sense, the po problem is not appropriately addressed, will not get better. I don't have anything else to provide. I have, I've given you all what I have. Okay. That's fine, thank Could you. I possibly chip in there too? I, in my submission, I put um, some references for um, Lyon, this electorate, is the oldest electorate in Australia. And also, uh, Payne Australia, in a Deloitte's a report two years ago, said the highest rate of chronic pain in Australia is in this electorate as well. So we also feature highly in issues like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and poorly in issues like socio-demographic uh, factors. Dr. Roberts. Dr. Roberts, in your opening statement and through questions that you, in exchange with Mr. Mr. Khan, you made reference to, um, to a, a, a previous gynecologist who worked up here. Now, you're referring to Dr. Emil Gaid, G-A-Y-E-D. Is that right? Correct. That's right. Um, are you still looking after the patients <laughs> yes. that he ruined their lives? 200 women? Yes. yes. So what has been the... I, I see your colleague next, next to you is also nodding his head. Why do you think that he was allowed to operate for 16, 17 years by the local health district up here? What, is it because of staffing shortages? They just look the other way? What was the reason that you, you think that he was allowed to uh, act like a barbarian? Honestly, I believe it was because there was no one in a role mm -hmm. with, with the proper level of expertise yep. who, who could judge what he was doing. And, and you need someone with, with the time and expertise to look into the complications and see if there's a common thread. And, and that's what Gail Finesse pointed out in those comments I, yep. I, I made. A, and it's not that a staff specialist is, is special in relation to a VMO, but they have that paid time. They're not running a business separately. They're not missing out if they're doing this investigation. They're not missing out on seeing patients and, mm -hmm. and making sure that they can run their business and, and pay their, mm -hmm. their staff. You needed someone. A, and at the time, the medical superintendent, who was in charge at the time, said that's why he didn't pick it up. The medical superintendent who followed him said the same thing, and the general manager said the same thing. We all said that was what was missing, because within nine months of me arriving there, mm -hmm. without having any forewarning of him, it, 
he, he's not there anymore. And it's not because there is absolutely nothing special about me. It is just that there was someone in that role. There was someone there who had the, the time and means to check what was going on and, and follow up complications and see if things were being, being done correctly. And, and look, I, I, I can tell you stories about a, a woman who was 20 getting seven curette procedures in 13 years, none of, none of which were indicated. And in, in six of them, it's a, it's a diagnostic procedure, you're meant to get some tissue so it can be looked at. In six of the seven, he didn't get tissue. I, I don't know what he was doing. And the one occasion he got tissue is because a registrar performed the procedure. Was he? he he's putting the device in, waving it around, so he can claim the money for it. Terrible. And, and I, have, I, have, I have tried to raise this as an issue because this, isn't, this, this aspect of the care isn't being followed up. Do you think that, do you think that the local health district ignored ignored his activity if all, if in fact signs came forward or questions were no, raised no, because of a lack of staffing and I I I don't think so honestly think so. yeah and what I about what about the women who suffered under him yeah. under his so-called care yeah. what what's happening Look, I I can say that in my opinion that some of those complications yeah. were were then understated Okay. Sorry, under were then under, they were under investigated oh, and the under seriousness of them was under understated. So there's a lady who had a, um, an infection following a hysterectomy and she ended up with gangrenous bowel and I, I know this, we're now 10 years down the track and she still has a stoma and she still has an enormous um, wound hernia. Now, no, I can I can tolerate a complication if an operation has to be done. Now, complications occur. We all get complications. I'm not complication free. Mm -hmm. So this was initially put in as what we call a SAC two, saying no, this, this is a serious thing. It was downgraded to a SAC three, saying it's a moderate temporary inconvenience. She still has a stoma. Don't tell me this is a SAC three. There was a case when a lady, he, he's doing, he's burning the lining of the uterus as a, as a treatment. Now, you don't do this for postmenopausal bleeding. You don't do it if a person has a precancerous condition. Well, he did it on a lady for postmenopausal bleeding and she had a precancerous condition there. And she turned up a couple of years, like uh, a few months after he was had his licence removed or not renewed, and she died a few weeks later, and, she, and it's because she had a procedure on a on a precancerous lesion on her uterus. And I, I I'm horrified by this. So I put it in as a sac one, like you know she's dead, and she needn't be dead. If she'd had the product, the correct operation, she'd be alive. And it was downgraded to a sac three. By who? Who downgraded it? Someone in governance. I I don't want to bring in third yeah. parties. And then I got in strife because I conferred with colleagues to see, am I insane? Is this, is this not one of the most serious things you've ever heard? And people from governance are yelling at me down the phone, how dare you question this? Why are you asking other people? Are you, are you being supported? Do you I'm sorry. Sorry. It's. I haven't received as much support as we needed and the women haven't received as much support. The last time I spoke, uh, people, uh, people from uh, Hunter New England um, executive have made it clear that this matter is over and they don't want to talk about it anymore. They made that clear to me in two years ago, that the GAD matter is over, it's over, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Dr. Um, 
Can I just ask, sorry, uh, okay. I'm going to share this, but, but, but Dr. Clearly there is a legacy issue which is going to have a long tail for these women who uh, obviously had this experience that will run into many years in front of us. Yes, yeah, so in gynaecology clinic yesterday, two of the six patients in, in the morning were, were ex-patients of Dr. Gayad. Um, and, and one of them was a direct... Is it, I, I saw her for, a, for follow-up of the procedure he did and an ongoing treatment. And I think in the end, yeah, she's going to need major surgery perhaps now. Which may perhaps she could have done without. I ask that individuals like that, in a sense, have they been red circled as individuals that need to be particularly looked after given they arose from these circumstances and uh, their care is going to be yep. obviously taken into account? So last Friday I got called to theatre to see a patient because she was an ex guide patient. Is, is that what you're kind of getting at? Like that they are. They're highlighted by, oh, this could become a legal issue. It, and for me, it's not a legal issue, it's, it's a medical issue. I just want, I want these women to be well, and I, I want us to put in the steps to stop it happening again, even though it's painful, even though it's hard. And it is hard. I, I've, I've spoken to secretaries of health, I've spoken to health ministers. I have emails from secretaries of health saying we're not going to respond to your emails anymore. A and it's it's out of a frustration that things aren't aren't being done. A and it, it is hard, and not everyone's in agreement. But what you need someone. Unfortunately, some doctors are are not honest, and some doctors are not safe. And even though the vast majority are, you, you need these safety mechanisms. Um, I think. We do, we've got to share it around. Can yeah, we yeah, okay, I'll, I'll just ask okay, one, on one quick one to Dr. Um, Nara Simon. Um, you talked about working 80 hours a week as the region's only cardiologist. How does working 80 hours a week affect your ability to provide care to patients? So um, I'm lucky that I only sleep four hours a day, oh. and I can I can and I have boundless energy to burn. Uh, that's an advantage I have. Um, it doesn't affect my ability to provide care, but it fr it incredibly frustrates me that I cannot provide the contemporary, current, expected care to my community and my patients. Um, I've been advertising for five years for a second cardiologist on my own time effort, blah, blah, blah. Um, the phone call is unique. First, I have to educate most Australians where Tari is, which is interesting. As a naturalized Australian, I'm educating the locals where the region is. The second question is, do you have a public hospital? I said yes. Third question is, do you have updated cardiology services? which is an updated CCU, a cath lab, and the ability to provide and treat heart attacks locally. I said no. Any options? No. Any future plans? No. Thank you very much for your time. So that leaves me in a position of no win, and I've got to do this. Now, I agree with Dr. Roberts that we need to have governance. We need to have ability to provide and care for people. And I've had similar experiences. I have met the health minister, the current one, and in his office in Sydney. And I've asked questions. You know, we mm -hmm. are in a faraway area. Yeah. I don't think we need c cardiac surgery or neurosurgery in Tari. I'll be the first one to fight it. But we need to have updated services so we can attract other specialists, nurses, pharmacists, and other allied healthcare. We don't have an active pharmacy majority of our patients do not have pharmacy reconciliation because there's not enough pharmacists. So there has to be a solution. And sweeping it under the carpet, like the royal family or Downton Abbey, is unhelpful. You've Do got to address this straight out. Okay. Yes. Doctor, what do you do if you're the only cardiologist in Tari? Yes. 
I what, no, what, what do you do if you want to go on a holiday? So, before COVID uh, came in, uh, I visited my family in Dubai, uh, and I met my cousins after 30 years. I got phone calls because we had Wi-Fi, and I got ECG sent to me, which I answered, and I said, I'm sorry, I'm in another continent. So, I have my colleagues who are fantastic, who support to the best of their ability. We have an excellent network in John Hunter Cardiology who are very helpful and supportive. Before I came here, everybody had to leave to have everything done, meet people, have a conversation. We don't have all that. But it is still unacceptable. It is still unacceptable. It is no point people acknowledging age and the oldest demographic, but nothing is being done. You know? Having, yes, I understand, I acknowledge, I feel your pain. That does not save lives. My colleague. Uh, or, um, Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Narasimhan, um, you talked in your opening statement. Sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, you talked in your opening statement about this real disconnect, and in your submission, you, you talked about um, $20 million for 12 car parks um, and new beds uh, that don't fit in hospital rooms. I mean, this all sounds quite absurd. Um, you know, how are these decisions being made? What, what, what's the what's the fallback? So, if I knew the answer, I would be the first one to stand on the top of this building and share with the whole world. So, there is no consultation. So, if we say we need a table and a chair to help this pr process get better, we go to our line manager or whoever, he then goes up, or he or she goes up, and then we get saying that, we, yes, everything has been acknowledged, accepted, we have read everything, we have submitted to the Ministry of Health, politicians, blah, 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 and we get a pencil. So $20 million for car park was, I don't even think that car park is functional, to be absolutely honest. So we have an updated, nice renal and an oncology service. The problem is, the local nephrologist was not contacted and his opinion was not sought to build the facility. If a person has something needing acutely done, like an x-ray, can't achieve it because it doesn't fit. So now they have built everything, then they have gone and refurbished it. Majority of the tradies in town are either patients or friends of mine. I can tell you how much money has been wasted on erecting scaffolds, pulling it down, re-erecting scaffolds. I, I have more information which I can share, but I, it might not be the place for it. So the decisions are being made by, I'm not sure whom, but I am 100% sure they've been made by people who don't live and work here. Living in the middle of Newcastle or in Coogee Beach and deciding what the hell Tari needs is inappropriate. It is totally inappropriate because we are the ones who are here dealing with these sick patients, and there has to be a better there has to be a better way. There has to be. I mean, Victoria told us this: build it, and we will come. It's called freezing in Victoria, and that hospital is doing well. Dubbo and Orange is an example. Port Macquarie was a fishing village when my wife, who is from this part of the world was a young girl. They are a thriving metropolis. And I am not sure why. Tari was the big hospital in the 70s where Katrina had her ear surgery. Now, we are so downgraded, it is, I, I don't even know if I can call it a joke. I'm going to retire here. I'm not leaving. But I have to make, and my colleagues are going to help me to make this better. Because we have a community support. We cannot just carry on the way it is. We are tough in the country, but there is a limit to that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Roberts, we, we've heard in other parts of this inquiry that um, the system around recruitment and retention is quite different in Queensland than it is in New South Wales. My, my understanding from your submission is that you've worked in both states. Um, have you yourself noticed a difference? Um, and if so, what should we be borrowing from what Queensland does to make things better here in New South Wales? So in, in terms of staff specialists uh, and, and probably VMOs, I, I believe that the pay scale differs on the remoteness of where you're working. 
So, for instance, and no, no disrespect to Broken Hill, I, I wouldn't want to live in Broken Hill. I like living by the sea. If I was to live in Broken Hill, I'd, I'd want to be paid more. And, and I think that's... I often see um, advertisements for working in Broken Hill and they must really struggle because it's a long way away. The travel would be more in, grievous and then, yeah, it's, it's, it would be a difficult place to work. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's not brain science. It's not even orthopedic surgery. You, you need, yeah, that's a doctor's joke. That's really funny, actually. I think it's helping us all. So. The, the, the other thing is that they're, they're paid for when they're on call and for call-ins. So if you're living in regional or, or rural Australia and you're on call one in four nights, and I'm, I'm, in, I'm on call two on seven nights, so I'm on call Wednesdays and Thursdays. If you're on call one in four, you don't get paid for that. And you don't get paid for on call. So you could be in the hospital from 6.30 in the morning till 6.30 the next morning and, and you get paid e exactly the same. So when I moved to Manning Hospital, they said, oh, yeah, that, that's true, but we'll give you time in lieu. There's no opportunity for time in lieu. It, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, and, and in Queensland, you paid for for call in. So if you get if you get called in and you're there all night, you get paid for those hours, which to me seems seems reasonable. Now, if you're in a city hospital, you might be on call one in twenty, and you're paid exactly the same amount. Mm -hmm. And you have to you've been on a train a six year training program, five years of which are in the city. Your spouse is in the city, working in the city. The you bought a house, the kids are in school in the city, we're trying to get people to move to regional and rural Australia and give up that thing, give up all of that, and for what? Because like you said, they don't know the lifestyle. They don't know how great it is to, to go a couple of kilometres offshore and catch snapper. They, they don't know what it's like. All they see is they have to sell their house, the spouse has to change jobs, the kids have to change schools, and, and, and they and maybe the area doesn't have the sort of schools that they want to send their kids to, or they think they want to send their kids to. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference in Queensland, mm -hmm. and that's why they don't struggle quite so much to get people to regional and rural areas. Thank you. So I've just got one more quick question. So, Doctor, do you have some, uh, Sorry. something you want to contribute to that answer? Yeah, thank you. I have, an appointment. I have an appointment in Queensland Health as well. I go once a month and provide acute uh, STEMI mm -hmm. or full-blown heart attack services where we wake up at 2 in the morning and take them to the cath lab and stent them. I do that once a month in my exciting life. And the one thing we, as Dr. Roberts has eloquently summarized, that is an advantage Queensland has over New South Wales Health. Um, if you take Broken Hill as an example and Manning as an example, I'm fairly confident we are far better. We are not far from Sydney. We are not far from Port Macquarie or from uh, Newcastle. We have vineyards and rivers and lakes. I live by the river. The so if you take a doctor, for example, I'm 53. I'll probably hopefully live till 80. The first half of my life, I've spent training. The second half of my life, I have family, children, practice, superannuation, retirement, making sure the children are sorted out. So for a doctor, work is worship. You tell a doctor to come here. This is paradise. We have dragons, purple clouds, beautiful beaches, supermodels feeding you grapes, and you can't work. Nobody will come here because half our life we have spent training. To come to a place where the hospital is up to code is, I believe, a great step forward to attract staff. Majority of my surgical colleagues are over 65. We have two surgeons under the age of 50. When my co surgical colleagues, who are, and Dr. Roberts' colleagues who are over 65 retire or catch the A train, as they say in the world of cardiology, we don't have a plan to replace the surgeons. Cardiology and surgery are not very different. We, can't, we, we are a dynamic speciality. You can't get a surgeon to come and work in this hospital where there's no operating theater. Nobody will come. It's the same thing. 
So Queensland has strategies to address. They have this public-private partnership. They have got a whole range of activities which they call upon, which New South Wales, the first and the biggest state, has not. So I hope that's helpful. No, no, that's Very fine. helpful. Thank you. Take down and enjoy your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Roberts, and I'll just say at this stage I could ask um, all three of you multiple questions, but we don't have much time. So I only have a few questions. Unfortunately, time for a few questions. Dr. Roberts, I just wanted to, you, uh, during your opening statement, of course, you referred to the fact that there were some, that there are some recommendations in relation to the Gayed case that haven't been acted upon, and I think it's. Um, I'd like to just explore some of those, if I if I may. But I did want to. You have said in your submission that there may be dozens of Gayeds employed and acting without appropriate clinical oversight. You mentioned that essentially, in terms of EMOs, there's no one to report to. So what exactly? What checks are there? in place for VMOs? If, if there's no director or in yes. the... Yes. I mean, within the hospital, it's very difficult, as, as Gail Finesse pointed out, that, you know, you, you don't have the letters, you don't have the investigations, you don't have the reports. person with complications can go back to their rooms and you just never know about it. So it... And, and there may not be anyone else in theatre with the knowledge to say, hold on, that's not what he's really doing. A and if you've got those suspicions, there's no one to go and have a look. So, so, so I, I, sorry. You know, the vast majority of PMOs are, are just honest, hardworking people. I, I, I want to make it really clear because this has been misinterpreted. Yeah. My issue is not with PMOs. Yeah. And and I actually agree completely with Simon Holiday. I've worked with some staff specialists who were so lazy it caused me a great deal of distress. And that's that's why you need a director there to make sure that staff specialists are working, and that VMOs aren't. So what are some of the potentially what doing are, the wrong thing? Yeah. What are so some of the key recommendations or themes I think you referred to as well that haven't been addressed that you would like to, to raise this afternoon? I, I think it's the, the lack of ha actually having clinical directors in various departments in regional and rural, rural hospitals. And the reason you don't have them is because you don't have staff specialists in that, in that role. And, and I'm not saying replace all VMOs with staff specialists. I wouldn't want that. Be, be, because you, you do have a private system out there that is taking the load off, off the of the public system, you need both, and, and I think you need both. But I, I think that those some of those governance issues, uh, well, I've seen it. Those governance issues weren't there; they weren't addressed. And I've had VMOs in this hospital say, "I wouldn't look at another doctor's notes. That's insulting." That's the job as director. It's not fun. Uh, last Friday we had a high risk meeting, something that would never have happened unless there was a director there and a properly functioning unit a and someone was trying to wanting to do something outside of the guidelines a and they're wanting to do it out of the goodness of their own heart. You know, they want to be kind for someone, to, for someone. But if our hospital doesn't have the correct equipment and safety procedures for that patient, that patient needs to go to a, a tertiary hospital, not with us. And if there was no director there, and there's there's no properly appointed director in in some other departments within the hospital, and I'm sure within a lot of New South Wales health. Dr. Nelson. Thank you. So um, I agree with Dr. Roberts. So when I started in the Manning Hospital, I was the first director of medicine. I started as a staff specialist, but I was provided no staff specialists requirements like an office, a secretary. So I took my colleagues, senior colleagues, who advised me that that will never happen. They've been here for 20 years. It's better you become a VMO. So most of the Department of Medicine are all VMOs. We now have co-chairs. So after five years, I stepped down because it's only fair. And now we've got, finally, the hospital has appointed two VMOs who co-chair. We have a very robust system of the Department of Medicine. Uh, we are the biggest department. 
we get the largest consumer of, con of the resources because we've got the most patients. 90%, 80% of the hospital patients are us. Uh, our physicians uh, manage them. And the surgical patients always have medical problems. So as a VMO-driven department, we have got very strict guidelines. We have, because this is something which we all spoke as a group. I brought it in from my experience in John Hunter and overseas. And now it, we have just built on the experience. So I agree with uh, Dr. Roberts, but not every department and not everybody, every hospital which has got a VMO-driven department is as, because as you, as you all understand and hopefully acknowledge, that this is not a VMO or staff specialist problem, it's an individual problem, right? So we just unfortunately had a bad practitioner who has left this whole region in a disarray. But our department, oh, well, horrible, whatever the term is, but our department has got our VMOs and we have got an official co-director system and we deal with everything appropriately and there's no issues. But Do Dr. Sure Holliday, I think, also wanted to comment on that. I think Sorry. in the bigger picture, we don't really have a system where um, to make sure most doctors are performing at an adequate level apart from waiting for complaints. There is, uh, all doctors have to do continuing professional development. That means usually attending education. But in terms of finding out when the, you've got the bad apples or whatever, uh, we tend to wait on a complaint system. And I, I think this is uh, trying to close the door after the horse has bolted. Um, when I was doing anaesthetics in, um, in the UK, we had morbidity and mortality meetings, M&M meetings, and that was not just the snacks. Morbidity is when uh, you have a, a problem from uh, something you've been involved in, or mortality is when someone dies. And I think it'd be really good maybe for us to make um, discussions with our peers more comfortable where we do say, look, you know, I did this and it we didn't have a really good outcome or we had a terrible outcome. And we often, um, I, I think if we get doctors working together and supporting each other and commenting on each other's work and feeling comfortable uh, trying to improve the services that we all provide together to the public, that would be a good thing. I, I think it's too easy to just blame one individual as a bad apple that operated within a system and the system didn't detect it mm. for decades. And, and I think Gal Finesse's report, sorry, in answer to your question, was more about how that was allowed to happen across areas, yep. Yep. and then within the hospital. And One just last question. Yep. What has happened to that report that you, who did you submit that to in terms of your themes and recommendations? Who have you submitted that to, and is it is it for public viewing or could the committee see it? I, I, I believe it's confidential. But I've been able to send it to the committee as a confidential report. And I believe that's, that's been sent to you electronically. Uh, that's Dr. I will write it for the committee secretary to liaise directly with you in terms of that document so it's treated in the way that you just requested. So we'll do that. Um, uh, gentlemen, doctors, thank you very much. It's been uh, a real privilege to have um, uh, such distinguished uh, witnesses all in one panel this afternoon. You've obviously collectively spent many years of dedicated work uh, on the Mid-North Coast um, and I'm sure the uh, uh, community is, is all uh, the better for it in terms of their health and wellbeing and on behalf of the community I'd like to thank you for that contribution and, and hope the ongoing contribution you'll make and that uh, we ultimately can produce support with recommendations. We'll pick up some of the key ideas and thinking that's been brought forward this afternoon. So. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll have a quick turnaround now to the next panel, if we could, please. Yeah. Yes, no, that's my plan. Yeah, no, that's my plan. Yep. No, no.
We'll just wait a couple of minutes. Uh, I know the Honourable Trevor Khan over there is uh, about to come back uh, and we'd be grateful for that. Rounding up MPs uh, is not the easiest thing, I have to say. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, what we might do is just get through the formalities, which is the swearing in and the affirming, uh, whilst you're here, and the others are, I can assure you, uh, returning shortly. So, um, if we can do that, uh, I don't know. So thank, thank you both very much uh, for coming on this afternoon. Uh, Mr Tickle and uh, Ms Hoskins, OIM, it's uh, greatly appreciated you made your time available to uh, be with us this afternoon. Uh, now, in terms of the, uh, the swearing or firming in, we'll need you, uh, starting from my, my left, uh, Mr Tickle, uh, name, position, title, or I think that you're appearing as a private citizen, so to identify yourself as such, this swear either the oath or the affirmation, whichever you prefer, the words of which are before you. So we'll start with you first, Mr Tickle. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, my name's Alan Tickle. Um, I'm appearing as a private citizen. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms Hoskins, can I invite you to do the same? Uh, my name's Marion. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no, that's okay. Marion Hosking, uh, I want to affirm. Please do, yes. And you're appearing as a private citizen this afternoon. And I'm a private citizen. Thank you. And yes, please. And please what did I have? What else did I have to say? No, that's the two. Now it's the affirmation okay. for you. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, particularly after. Now you could actually. The there's some words for the affirmation before you, so we'll just. Where, so what if you could just I repeat those. No, that's fine. That's fine. Take your time. If you could just repeat those words, that would be great. Okay, I, I will do it now. Thank you. As instructed. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Much appreciated, much appreciated, Ms Hosking. So what we'll do now, um, you just take your time, there's, there's a... Uh, water there, so feel free to, um, it's a fresh water, so feel free to have a sip of the water and at any stage you can have a pause and uh, take a sip, that's completely okay. Uh, what we'll do now though, if we could and you're agreeable, is to uh, move to the opening statements. Now before I do so, can I just acknowledge and thank you both uh, for your submissions to this inquiry. Uh, they have been received and processed and stand uh, as submissions to the inquiry and that's obviously evidence to the inquiry. Uh, Mr Tickle, yours is submission 222. Uh, and Ms Hosking, uh, yours is submission 032. Uh, and I also note, uh, for the record, uh, um, uh, Mr Tickle, that you've provided some further material this afternoon. There's a, a letter on the cover, a co photocopy of a letter on the cover, uh, oh, sorry, there's a, a copy of a letter on the letterhead of Leslie Williams MP uh, and a document which is with it uh, titled Hunter New England, Lower Mid uh, North Coast Child Clinical Services Plan 2013-2017. So we have all of that documentation, so thank you. So can I invite you to make an opening statement? If you can keep it reasonably tight, and that maximises the opportunity for questions. So start with you. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, uh, distinguished members of the, the parliamentary inquiry, um, I will also acknowledge that the elders past and present are emerging. Um, and I think the reference to that is um, highly applicable given that there's something like 6% of the population in this area Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I'd also like to acknowledge um, in the audience um, Liz Hayes, and I think the, the whole of this area is in, indebted um, for some of the aspects that she has raised in a 60 Minutes program which, which brought a lot of this to light. Um, Mr Chair, the, the opening statement, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll come um, cut to the chase. I, I, I will touch on aspects of, of governance, um, probity and accountability, which is in the submission. But I get to, to, to cut straight to the, the chase, and I guess, and, and picking up what other speakers have alluded to. If we, we look at the history of, the, of this, um, the Manning Hospital, um, 16 years ago, the North Coast uh, Health District from Tweed Heads down to Tyree was run out of Lismore. Then with a stroke for pen, sometime later, there was a split where you had the, the, the North Coast District from Tweed Heads down to Coffs Harbour. Coffs Harbour then... Uh, through to Port Macquarie. Now it's worth noting that the difference in the number of hospitals and 
and population that those health districts serve in contrast to Hunter New England local health district. Um, the the Midcoast district, seven hospitals, 211,000 people. On um, the Northern local he health district, 12 hospitals, 288,000 people. Both have direct budget allocations and continue to grow in resourcing while Manning Hospital has suffered. It's also worth noting that the, the Manning Hospital, the catchment that's served, is served by Manning Hospital, is actually larger by population than the catchment of Port Macquarie Hospital. So you can, you can understand the disquiet and the, the catalyst in 2016 when I was at that time a Deputy Mayor um, chaired a public meeting concerning the resourcing of the local hospital. And that mobilised the community to say enough is enough. I'm also the, the trustee chair of First Step Counts um, organisation, which is involved with early intervention um, for early childhood, which has also been highlighted by uh, earlier speakers. I want to contrast the Heart of New England Local Health District, which is made up of 38 hospitals and a population of close to 1 million, million people. And further concern is the makeup of the, the board of the Hutter New England Local Health District. There's one representative from Foster, and the rest of the board is dominated by the New England district and the close environments, environs to Newcastle. Now, I'll put it to the um, distinguished um, parliamentarians. It's been discussion about the, the role of the local health district and where Manning ought to reside. My concern is this, that in the previous um, health district we were the bottom end of Lismore, now we're the top end of Hunter New England. I think it's incumbent upon the parliament, and I'm looking here at three levels of government, local, state and federal, to work out what their role is. It's absolutely abominable disgraceful that during the period of COVID-19, state of origin occurred where the Premier of Queensland uh, put up a, a, a line and said, no, you shall not go into the Brisbane Hospital. This is largely funded by the federal government. So it's critical that we look at the role of John Hunter Hospital and how it services the likes of Port Macquarie in another health district. And if the, if the will is there to recognise that the Manning Hospital more appropriately belongs in the Mid-North Coast District, there be adequate compensation with additional funding to allow for that from the Parliament, and that the, that the role of John Harder Hospital in servicing that area is not lost. Some of the concerns I've had as far as probity, when I want to look at the, the board, and I found a, a massive difference in accountability from health district to health district. One only has to look at the various websites of the various health districts to question where is probity, where is account accountability, where is their governance flowing down for the Ministry of Health, that where there's KPIs and, and, and where is the accountability to the Minister. There's a laissez-faire attitude where we will set our own, um, go, our own um, policies without any accountability, which I pointed out in the submission that, that, that by contrast to what occurs in local government for example. The board minutes that I see from, from Hunt New England Health, they're supposed to be meeting, meeting monthly, yet in 2020 the minutes appeared of six board meetings. In 2021 so far the minutes have been recorded or appeared on the website for February 2021 only. And what is apparent when I look at those minutes is report number such and such, no report. Report on such and such, no report. Report on something else, noted. There's a complete lack of resolution from the board, complete lack of accountability, benchmark and uh, indeed um, outcome based expectations of the board upon the CEO and those who serve in Hunter New England Health. I got really excited when I saw mention of, of, of Manning Hospital and that was all about a name change. And then we saw some board minutes referring to the challenges of the clinical services plan, which this community started agitating in 2016 to have addressed, because you'll see in front of you the date says 2013 to 2017, and now we have it 2021, 
where finally there's been sign off on a clinical services plan. Yet we find the irony when we, we read through the, the, the notes from the 2013 clinical services plan. In tying building projects to clinical priorities, um, th th there's got to be a link to clinical, clinical services. Yet the, the, the health board didn't think it was appropriate to actually pursue and update the, the expired clinical services plan. Page 22 uh, highlights the, the, the challenges that occurred for Manning Hospital and how to meet those challenges is, OK, people, go to Port Macquarie or you go to Hunter New England Health. Much of the problems we have now were highlighted in 2013, yet nothing was done about it until this community said, enough's enough, and drove it to the extent where it became an election issue the last state election. And we had a bidding war. Here's $60 million. We'll call you and raise you by another 40. Now it's $100 million. But yet when that was put to the CEO of Hunter New England Health, if you're going to get $100 million, you might as well build a new, a new hospital. But, but what is your priorities? How are you going to manage the money when we get it? When we get it, we'll work out the priorities and how we're going to spend it. Now, members of the, the inquiry, I point out that, that that money is not yours. It belongs to the taxpayers. And it's not for you to put it out for political opportunism. The need, if an organisation would be local government, or whether it be a, a community group, went to a state government and said, we want a grant, there needs to be a business case. There needs to be an outcome based to justify that grant. Yet political opportunism allows money handed out without a business case to justify it. Not good enough. And the whole issue around probity, if we compare what occurs with local government, and it goes to all LGAs. You will start with a community plan. That will cascade down to an integrated planning mechanism that's non-negotiable. It is, it is the governance is, is over, the oversight is from the Office of Local Government and much of the planning instruments, in fact, has to be signed off by the planning minister or the minister for local government. But the same appears not to occur when it comes to the vitality of public health in New South Wales. Where is the accountability from the Department of Health in how health districts operate, how boards operate, the accountability of boards, and how people in regional areas will get their fair equity? Because it is not good enough, public health is suffering, and the regions have said we have had enough. Well, thank you, uh, Mr Tickle, for that. Um Frank and forthright opening statement. Uh, Ms Hosking, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes. <coughs> this will be sort of male, female. <laughs> no, that's OK. I, I'm, I'm, no, no, that's, that's OK. Um, if, if we could keep it to maybe two or three minutes and then we can open up for questions. That would be the important part, well, if you could. Well, I've changed all my... I've ch I've ch oh, I'm sorry. I've changed my thing uh, because of what I've heard. And strangely enough, I never thought I would... Be saying, I've been through this uh, well, 30, 30 years ago. Well, we came to Tauri in 40 years. Now, Marion, don't cry. Came to Tauri 40 years ago and became involved as I was in Sydney, hence the OAM, for what it's worth these days. Head of Credlin. Uh, <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> so... so I've been working for women's issues and okay. came up here okay. and I won't go the long, the long and short of it was we, we got a women's refuge going. Highly successful. State, state funded, uh, federally funded, state managed, community based. Everyone was employed. The, the First Nation people were the first time they'd had proper jobs. Well, okay. Then I can't remember how many years, just two or three or four years ago, all this stuff that you're talking about starts happening. And uh, I'll again cut the story short and say we now no longer have the refuge and neither have a lot of people up and down the coast. Mm. They gave it to the Samaritans, mm. a non-secular 
a religious organisation and ours was a secular organisation. They just handed it to him without reference to the president or the committee. It was just as you described. Before you know it, they jump on you and it's gone. So you're in the process of losing, we are in the process of losing our, our hospital. I tell you what, it's that close. If you don't do something about it, you won't have a hospital. Oh, it's just down the road to Newcastle. That's what they'll say. Oh, they don't need a, they don't need a refuge. Uh, we've got police, we've got 1700 respect or whatever they call it. It's nothing. So, I've been through it and I know it will happen. So, I accepted this offer to sub submit my views in general, impressions and experiences of Manning Valley Health and Hospital Services. And this is where I've got to be careful not to cry. Um, because my um, son died. Take your time, take your time. Have a sip of water. Yep. But you can't be here forever. No, that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> take your um, time. On the one hand, the state spent thousands and thousands of dollars on taking him to... Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, of taking him to um, for trials. Very much appreciated at the time because you, each trial you think this is it. But while they spend thousands on his trials, they then already have the heap of dead ready for you to toss him onto that. So when he comes back and this trial doesn't work and that trial doesn't work, no, no, Rick, it doesn't work. Well, what do we do with him? Oh, there's that heap of dead over there at, at Ringle, dead or dying. So toss him over there, which they did, without reference to me. Could you read this bit? Because I think you should. Thank you. But that's, is that in your statement that you're wanting to present? I'm not sure. I'll, no, I'll, I'll try and make myself. I got there one day and um, I went every day and up at the end it was this court you can't be here forever let's wait there if, if it's in a statement Miss Hoskins it might be easier yeah, look, okay. if, if it's only you, when I talk you, about no, that's that. That's okay. It's very, very difficult. I understand. Okay, so but, but, but if the statement comes forward to us, we will have that. You can have it. And, and that will provide the detail, perhaps, it's of what you're wanting to... Uh, or, is, did you want to yeah. perhaps yeah. kick out the paragraph? That yeah, look, on behalf of... He's a friend. Uh, on, on behalf of course, of, Marion, of course, of course. Um, my personal experience during my son's dying days were disappointing. While he was at home, a nurse appeared at intervals, leaned to the doorway of his room and asked in a merry voice, how are your bowels, Rick? By not entering the room, she was indicating she was in a hurry. Rick was also visited by two kind males and on one occasion advised Rick to go to hospital because of cellulitis setting in. They were kind but did not visit regularly. It was never suggested that Rick be supplied with a particular bed. My husband was never visited by palliative care or if so, without my knowledge. Now, you'll never ask me again, will you? Um, the thing was, I got, to the, I got there to the hospital, or to Coringal. It's very fresh, very clean, very bright. And you think, oh, this is not bad. You know, it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> but they have no nurses. It might have one or two, not enough staff. Anyway, he was right up the end of the corridor naked and looking like this. The feces were right up in the corridor. Uh, so I dashed up to get him and banged the, the thing and up came the poor nurse two steps at a time up those granite steps 
she'd fallen, she'd killed herself. So she comes up three, two steps at a time, rushes in. He had walked past his own suite looking for a lavatory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So ended up there, trapped. So they, they brought him back and cleaned him up. Just imagine what they had to do. Yeah. And cleaned him up. And uh, then the other awful thing, perhaps you can't avoid it, I don't know. Uh, the last few nights I stayed with him and two, two husky men in white coats, like something out of a horror movie, stopped him, turned him over, stick, stick morphine in, out they go. And he's so weak, he's trying to fight a bit, can't. So after the second night of that, with no reference to me again, as if I'm not there, I then went out to the head nurse, or whatever she was, and said, Dr. Keegan authorised uh, morphine. What do you call it? A syringe morphine. driver. A syringe driver. <laughs> morphine driver. Will you please? Syringe driver for that pain Will you control. please put, yeah. that, put that on? Oh, uh, in the morning. I said, no. Well, cut a long story short there. I'm shouting. Hmm. Finally, they said, well, he can have it when the chemist brings it on his first round. But first, I went right down the track. He was going to come at the last round. The second last round. So bite, bite, bite. So finally, they put that on. And uh, so I think that was my last bite. Well, I suspect it's probably not your last bite, Miss Hosking. You strike me as someone who is a very determined and a very compassionate woman. And uh, we thank you very much for being prepared to share. But can I say very personal. Else now? Please, yes. This will improve me. Uh, not improve me, but get my, the other side of me going. We are talking about a government up here, mm. not here, but a government that hates government. So it has a dilemma, doesn't it? So it wants to private everything, but it, it can't, doesn't dare come along and privatise the, the Babe Hospital in Tari. So it, ha it doesn't, it gives us bits. I'll change your name. You go and buy that MRA or whatever it is. Have a bit of this and have a bit of that. But what they really want is to get rid of the government hospitals. And they want to get rid of the government Medicare and they want to get rid of government health because they they are, that's not their thing. It's like asking me to take on their, their attitudes. Well, what we might do, we, thank you very much, we might move to the questioning. Now, we've got a bit of a time constraint, in fact, um, which is no one's particular fault, probably mine as a chair. Um, yeah, it's always mine. Um, but but I, listen, if, I, if we can... Have I said the wrong thing? No, you've not. No, no, no. I'm, I'm blaming myself in all respects, Mr. Osmond. Um, so if we do five minutes each, how does that sound? And uh, we'll see how we go. So that, that five minutes for the... Op I'll be very short. No, no, that's fine. That would, we just want to make sure we can get through this. So. Ms. Hosking, thank you. Thank you for, for your evidence. It's very intimidating and very difficult to sit here and answer questions and address us. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Mr. Tickle, you made, me you made mention about a clinical services plan now, I remember when I was Shadow Health in two, uh, five, six years ago, there was talk of the updating the clinical services plan to put it in line with the needs of the community. So is there a new clinical services plan or not? Um, I believe that has been signed off, and my understanding is that the CEO of um, Huntington Health, uh, Sir Michael D. Rienzo, yep. um, has kindly offered to uh, present that to the key stakeholders who have given input into that document, which we, we certainly look forward to. Have you, have you or the community seen the uh, document? No, no, we have not. Have you had input into the document? We, um, yes, the community had input into the document, um, and I was privy to, to part of that, um, that input, yes. Um, now, w w what were the key recommendations that the community had? What did, what do they think is the key to improving? Now, 
let, let's call us, let's call, let, let's name the issue properly. Look, Manning Base is in trouble. So yeah, look, the, the community in, um, highlighted um, needs, um, yeah. certainly, and that's been called out by, um, by various speakers. Um, look, I, I will pick up on something that um, Dr. Simon Holliday spoke yeah. about earlier, and also um, do, uh, Dr. Roberts. There's a concept that which, which we, I, I, I did meet with um, Dr. David Gillespie in and, and his, and his capacity as the Assistant Federal Minister for Health, and it's a concept around grow your own. And what we're looking at is where you have um, university attendees, whether it be nursing or whether it be medicine, to have some hex discount, some indenturing, some bonding to bring them back to this, this area. Yep. Um, and, and that was something that I, I guess there was a change in the federal budget where there was some consideration of that. But it's, we certainly need to incentivise because the problem we have at the moment is the revolving door of, a point, of a appointments coming to the area and the disappearing. And picking up what, um, what Dr Roberts spoke about with VMOs, the, the, the VMA model that's worked in Port Macquarie, Coffs Harbour and has, and has served as well in the Manning area um, it needs to be encouraged, it needs to be incentivised, it needs to be some, um, I guess, incentive for, for trainees to work under the VMOs because if there's the revolving door of those in the public system, it needs to be picked up with the VMOs. And, and while there was one slip through with, with, um, with, uh, with Dr um, Gayard, which was really a product of someone coming from overseas and not properly vetted in the first place, the VMA model has been served this community well and it's disturbing that that needs to be encouraged more, but I don't think it has been. And case now, in point is the obstetrician and gynecology. Now, you made reference to a debate about a name change to the hospital. Yeah. What, what, is, the, what is that? Oh, look, there's a public perception that, that calling us a Manning Rural Referral Hospital is a, is a downgrade, it's an insult. So the preferred name was Manning Base Hospital because we considered ourselves a base to serve this area, and that was preferred name has been renamed back to Manning Base Hospital. So what is it currently called officially? Uh, my understanding is Manning Base Hospital. Now, when it's a base hospital, it comes with certain levels of clinical care. Is that correct? One, one would expect that, and it has been highlighted by other speakers, that you'd expect to have capacity for, for acute care. Yep. Do you feel that, in fact, Manning Base Hospital is a base hospital or it's a referral hospital? Look, it's, I believe it is a base hospital, but hmm. there's certain aspects at the moment. Because of um, resourcing, uh, we need, need to re refer outside. Um, Mrs. Hosking wants to add something, Greg. Yeah, no, no. Can I have... Sorry, I just, uh, just put the mic... Am I able? No, yes. Please, 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 yeah. All right. Uh, I was alerted to the... Re I, I saw all these changes. There, there, there was Manning Base, and, and that was just nobody questioned that, and, and Manning Rural, and nobody questioned that. But I saw a little letter in the Tauri Times... And this woman said, why is it that my son is in Port Macquarie Hospital with a broken arm when I live next door to my hospital? Manning, Manning. referral. Well, he'd been referred. For what reason, who knows? But that referral means a lot. Don't ignore that word. They've used that word for, for specific purposes. Yep. Do you agree with that? Yep. So, no, thank you. I think we've got some... Yeah, cool. So it's going to sort of become fluid now. So, for, yeah, tr Honourable Trevor Khan. I've heard a lot of, uh, a lot of the comments made today, and I, I don't argue with a lot that's said, but um, I think Tamworth Hospital is actually Tamworth Referral Hospital. It used to be Tamworth Bucks. Um, and I'm 94. Sorry. I'm 94. So yeah. It, yeah, I will. I'll keep my voice up. So, so Tamworth used to be Tamworth Base Hospital for, for some few years now it's been Tamworth Referral Hospital and yet in terms of Manning Hospital um, some of the evidence today has been in a sense referring to the better services in hospitals such as Tamworth rather than, rather than at Manning. So I wonder if with respect too much concern is being expressed with regards to a, a name as opposed to its categorisation under the under the system that's adopted by New South Wales Health. Do you, do you have a view really in that regard? No. Oh, I'm very suspicious, as you can see. Oh, look, I you're don't think entitled to be suspicious. They don't put a name there for nothing. They, they think about that name. 
And, and so they referred my son to, to Karingal. Yeah. yeah. To the, to the Mr. Tickle, do you have okay. a name? Oh, look, I, I think it's, it's probably a fair comment, but um, um, I, I guess it's a slap in the face to the community to say, look, um, you know, you're now a referral hospital, and I think from a PR exercise, that was a silly thing to do. Sure. Why, Look, why, I, yeah, I must yeah. admit, I prefer Tamworth Base Hospital as the name. I still probably call it Tamworth Base, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if we could get hung up too much on a name, I suppose. Where I can actually provide some insight into this because Wagga um, Base Hospital was renamed to Wagga Referral Hospital, and the name Referral Hospital is uh, to uh, represent that it's, it's a larger area that gets referred to. So, for example, places in, in around Wagga would refer to Wagga Base Hospital. Now, um, Wagga Base Hospital had been known as Wagga Base for a number of years, so uh, there was a community um, uh, movement and it was renamed back to Wagga Base Hospital from Wagga Rural Referral Hospital. So the name referral does not mean that they refer out. It usually means that they get referrals in. So I'll just, I'll just address that one first. So I, that, that isn't a concern. Okay, well that's we saw that it was Manning Rural. Okay, so well that's, it went from... That's, that's, it's yeah, had three name right. changes. Yeah. yeah. Now, well, well, while you, I've got the opportunity... Oh, oh, hang on, hang on. No, 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 come on. Listen, that, that wasn't a question. That was providing I was a addressing... The, yeah. Well, yeah, no, but, but listen. Let's, let's okay, try and do come it. On. Let's do cross bench time and then the government will have some oh, time. Sorry, I, no, 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 I thought it was government. Yeah, anyway. Well, just... Well, I'm just trying to... Yeah, no, 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 I don't, but see, I don't want to chew up crossbench. No, no, so cross, the crossbench, cross let's, let's get stuck into it. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, um, can, I, can I offer something else? Uh, can I just say that, yes. what, uh, we, perhaps at the end, let's get the question done first and we yes, can return okay. to it. So hold that thought, so Emma. Thank yeah. you. I, I actually have a couple of questions for you, Ms Hoskin. Um, I, as I understand it, you yourself were treated at Manning Hospital about 20 years ago. And I wanted, yes. I wanted to know how it's changed in that 20 years compared to what kind of service would be... Well, uh, I had my first hospital experience at Manning Base, whatever, I don't remember the name. Um, and I couldn't find fault with it, I think. The only thing I did... Kind of, do I dare say this about my doctor? I... That's right. I had pain. So I went to Dr. A, the GP, and he said, hmm, looks like um, whatever it is I had. And so then I went and had an ultrasound, and the ultrasound man said, oh, no, there's nothing, it's only crumbs. Back to the GP, and he said, oh, crumbs are important. Oh, yes. No, you'd better go to Dr. S. You've got to go to Dr. S, and, and he, he will operate. So I go to Dr. S and he says, yes, yes, that, that, that better come out, the gallbladder. So out came the gallbladder. And it wasn't that long, much later, that I was at Carajong for the evening, for the weekend. And I had this terrible night of pain. So along came the ambulance, took me to Windsor Hospital, lovely Windsor Hospital, with an amazing surgeon there. I died twice that night, so he said, because I had a gangrenous appendix. <laughs> I don't know if anybody here knows what that is like. It is ghastly. And 14 days, 12 days of vomiting, I think, hmm. after the operation. <laughs> I don't, and I don't want to point the finger at doctors. I think I wouldn't want to be a doctor in a million years. I think it's the most frightful job. They're not magicians. They can't see inside you. Mm. So I don't blame doctors. But the system that holds the doctors up, the hospital, should be the overseer. Mm. They should be able to say, well, we'd better look at that again. Do you think you really should be <coughs> taking that gallbladder out? Perhaps it's something else. Or that woman's terrible stuff they did to that woman. But one question. So, Ms. Hoskin, I just wanted to ask another question because, you know, you're talking about that system and, and there was something in your uh, submission that I was really concerned about and it's something that we've heard a bit of a pattern of here in this inquiry. You said that your son saw a gardener that was brought in oh, yes. uh, to sit with a dementia patient and, and, and look after that dementia well, that, patient. That was one of the times he was in hospital, at Manning, at Manning Hospital, 
I think he came home again. He went and came home a couple of times. And um, it was lung cancer, and he'd had operations with cutting of cancer. And um, down in, down at Wonderful... Now, that's a hospital I call the Wonderful John Hunter. Whether I really know what I'm talking about, I don't know, but that's the way I feel about John Hunter. And um, so uh, what happened? Oh, yes. So I went in there to see him, and he said, you know what, he said, there was a demented man in bed next to me this morning, and they, they had no staff. They got the gardener to come up and sit with him. <laughs> there was no reason to tell me that other than just amazement. Mm. And I was amazed. And, you know, really with Rick, I, I'm, uh, no, you're not going to, this is a very unpopular thing I'm going to say, but I'm not, I've volunteered all my life, but I don't believe in it. Because it's all right to go and be the pink lady and put the cream on the cake, yes. But we end up using volunteers and being ruled by volunteers. So instead of having, you don't have a volunteer army, you don't have a volunteer police force. So why should people go and risk their lives in the bush as volunteers or go into the hospital as volunteers? No. You, so we've got, I think it was volunteers that started the, um, you know, the... Uh, the help during during those what's what's it called? The help during the, your dying days, palliative care. Oh, oh, I, I nearly said something like that in front of somebody in a just a bit. <laughs> that because they're very precious and they're very they own their particular model of volunteers. But it is, that is, you can't run a good business or a good hospital, or a good school, on volunteers. Okay, and that's what a lot of these governments are trying to do, because it's cheap. We're just going to move on to some further questions, Ms. Austin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Mr Tickle, um, you were referring to uh, particularly the LHDs and um, accountability, which I think is extremely interesting. So who... Who does the LHD and the people on the LHD, who are they accountable to and who do they report to? Can you just kind of take us through that in a little bit more detail? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question, that one. Um, I, I was hoping that there's some, there would be some accountability um, to the public. Um, and you've only got to look at the trying to extract the current clinical services plan um, when it was announced to Parliament that it's been signed off on. They're trying to get a copy of that. Um, there's an issue there. Um, I got, I, I, back to what I said before, I think it's a matter for the Parliament to ask that question through the, through the, um, the Department of Health. Where is the accountability um, back to the Department of Health? One would have expected that there's a, that, that a Premier's plan or the Government of the Day um, policy concerning regional health ought to be communicated cascade down, benchmark, report back to make sure it's on track. I, I can't see evidence where that's occurring. So the answer, I, I haven't got an answer for that, but I believe the Parliament ought to ask for that and insist on it. Yeah, thank you. You also say in your submission, you point out that experienced emergency doctors reported this new regime yes. of triage. Yes. Could you just explain, or expand further upon that as well? Yeah, look... Um, <coughs> Just, just by way of background, I've, I've had, um, uh, for some years, um, medical staff uh, and VMOs um, meet with me in absolute confidence because they re the re regime I've been under and the threats for VMOs of complaining, staff complaining, the lack of, I guess, credibility or understanding of a, a whistleblower, they were in fear of complaining or bringing out issues that, that, that concerned them with, with the running of the hospital. Now, I guess the... the uh, uh, was, I, was no, I'll just ask, just <coughs> for clarification, they came to you in your position as what? Um, to they, they came in to me in my position as a community leader okay. who had been agitating on behalf of the community. Okay. Now, to answer the question, yes, it was pointed out by um, a senior clinician who had retired um, from emergency medicine. He said his observation is that what is coming out of the universities now, uh, which is adding to the cost and causing a, 
a bog down in process and emergency is that years gone by, the experienced clinician, clinician would take a history, they would interview the patient, they'd look at their observation and see if there's a repeat of what's occurring in front of them of what had happened in the past and then quite often make a diagnosis, do the treatment um, and perhaps it may be need follow-up with their GP and they would, be, they would be satisfied and out of emergency. Many times there's low socioeconomic where they cannot afford to go to a GP so they'll present with something that's fairly sim simple. What has been occurring is that the modern doctor will order a battery of tests um, unnecessarily, wait for them to come back, look at those results, do a, diagno do a diagnosis which is back to the obvious, chew up time, chew up expense, add to the waiting room and, and finally that patient gets the obvious treatment that should have been in front by appropriate inquiry. That is his observation and I respect that because he is an extremely experienced doctor in, emer in emergency medicine. So, sorry, I didn't mean to drop it on no, you. No, that, but, um, no, 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 I'm not. Look, if my concern anything. is yeah. that we've got one more round of witnesses. We do, yes. And, we're and I, I, look, I think that these witnesses have been very clear no, no. in their evidence. No, no. Unless anyone is compelling, I think... I just wanted to thank um, uh, Ms Hosking in particular for coming and sharing your story mm -hmm. um, and pass my condolences um, to you for... Um, um, for your loss of your son, but, but also just for, for coming and being so open and frank with us. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think it's providing some really valuable insights to, to us. So thank you. Marion Hoskin is certainly a legend in our area. She got the OAM just quite justly and she's been a, a, a wonderful warrior for, for women and women who have suffered at the hands of, 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 of men, which we're all appalled with but she's certainly a warrior and a legend and very respected in our community. Thank you. Uh, and, and we can tell that and that's thank why I just wanted thank to you make sure I... Thank you very much. Make so thank you both very, very much. Um, and uh, I won't repeat the same words, but we are most grateful. We're dismissed now, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. OK, we'll call our uh, final uh, set of witnesses for this afternoon, please, from the local health district. Yeah, no, no, that, that's fine. We'll just, no, no, that's fine. I just uh, commence, gentlemen, by, by apologising um, for the, the lateness of the call. Um, I hope you don't uh, see it as disrespectful. We'll provide you with plenty of opportunity in terms of your contribution this afternoon. We understand it to be important and I don't want it to be seen as uh, depreciated or diminished in any way by the fact that we're running a little bit late. So I do apologise uh, and accept responsibility for going over. But uh, we've had a number of uh, important witnesses today and um, we just want to get through the evidence as, as appropriately as we could. So just like to say that up front. Um, so we'll just get to the formality first, which is the, the swearing or affirming you in with respect to your evidence. So you probably both know the drill. So it's the name, organisation or position statement uh, or position uh, and uh, the oath or the affirmation. And if we just start with uh, Mr. De Lorenzo. My name is Michael De Lorenzo and I'm the chief in the local health district. Um, I swear that the evidence now and about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but Thank you very much. And just, they bring the microphones a bit closer. No, thank you, yes. Yeah. So um, just to in help with the audibility for the audience, perhaps 
just pull these a little bit closer. That might just help with that. Thank you. Yes, yes. So the other smaller uh, uh, mic is for the hand side. Oopsie daisy. So, uh, Dr. Choi. Yeah, my name is uh, Peter Choi. I'm here in my capacity as the director of medical services at John Hunter Hospital. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you very much, Doctor. So as you'd be aware, uh, the uh, New South Wales, or the Go New South Wales government, uh, via the New South Wales um, Department of Health, have an omnibus um, uh, uh, submission to this inquiry, which stands as submission 630, uh, which um, I'm sure you're aware of, and that's been obviously accepted and stands as a submission to the inquiry. Um, uh, uh, and committee members have, have, have seen that and studied it and are aware of its content. Um, so I invite uh, an opening statement uh, from, from yourself um, uh, uh, and keep it within a reasonable period of time if you don't mind, a few minutes, five minutes so, and then if you're agreeable we'd open up for questions around the table. So does that, does that suit you both? Yeah, of course. Great. Well, th thank you very much and we'll get underway the opening statement. Well, thank you. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, first I'd like to acknowledge that today we are meeting on the land of the Virupai people and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. On behalf of the district, I acknowledge the importance of this inquiry for our rural and regional communities, which in Hunter New England Local Health District, we have many. Um, they are asking us to hear their stories and learn about their individual experiences, and we're committed to listening and learning. Our staff work hard to ensure that people living in rural and regional and remote areas of the district have access to quality clinical care and experience the best health outcomes possible. Our staff have strong connections to the communities in which they live and are dedicated to providing the best care they can to their patients. Despite this commitment and a number of strategies employed over many years, we continue to face challenges securing the necessary clinical workforce for our large and expansive district on a daily basis. I know that we are not alone and that attracting and retaining the required workforce, especially GPs, to rural and remote locations is a problem being faced across the country. Today we have heard many people talk about their challenges, accessing care and medical workforce issues in our regions and I appreciate the bravery and the candour of those appearing as witnesses. While in most cases I believe that people receive quality care and good outcomes, I know that there are occasions when this is not the case. If we as a health service have let you down, then I truly am sorry. Please know that your personal experiences matter to us and as a district we have a strong culture of inquiry and accountability and ensuring that we learn from every missed opportunity or adverse outcome. Healthcare is a whole of system responsibility and as a district we are committed to working with the federal government and primary healthcare providers to build a more sustainable medical workforce in our rural and regional communities. I generally hope this inquiry assists us in achieving this goal and I welcome any recommendations forthcoming. Uh, finally, I, I've prepared uh, some information about the environment at Taree and at Gunnedah, because I believe you were there earlier today, that I'd like to table for the committee, and, and I've got copies available for everybody. Thank you very much. I find the committee secretary can... Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you for that opening statement, and, um, and uh, I acknowledge the, uh, the specific comments you've made. I uh, appreciate that very much. So we'll get underway with the questioning. Um, uh, so as I said, we're not going to uh, cut this short because it's very important witnesses this afternoon. So um, we were scheduled uh, to finish at 6.30 uh, on the presumption that we were actually going to be starting with yourselves at 5.30, which not, obviously did not happen. So we're going to go beyond 5.30, uh, but what we'll do is we'll just, we deal with uh, tranches of questions in say, what, 10 minute blocks or would you like three 15 minute blocks? Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll get through three 10 minute blocks and then we'll see where we are and then we can move into a second tranche of, of blocks, okay? So, we'll, people agreeable to that? Okay, well, we'll start with the Honourable Watts, Secretary. Um, Mr. Thank you. Why were the nurses protesting today outside um, Manning Hospital? My understanding is that the nurses today outside Manning Hospital were protest, protesting against, it was a statewide uh, dispute uh, that they're having currently with New South Wales government around uh, nursing ratios and, uh, and pay rates. It, so wasn't it, wasn't, a specific, uh, it wasn't specific to your, so the evidence we heard earlier today was incorrect? No, I can only tell you that uh, my understanding is that uh, they were there today, but the issues that they're uh, um, making comment about or, or trying to bring to the attention 
are a statewide issue, not a, a local. Oh, issue. so there are no problems at this hospital. Sorry. So there are no, so there are no problems at this hospital. They were I, not I didn't protesting. Say that, I, I didn't say there are no problems. I'm saying that the purpose of their action out, outside the hospital was a statewide action around uh, nursing ratios yep. and, of course, the the recent uh, uh, pay that uh, pay rate. Now you um, you you made reference to Gunada and um, Manning Hospital. Now. Um, why are there, um, oh, how many operating theatres are actually um, in Manning Hospital? Uh, Manning Hospital, um, I believe five, yep. Five. Are all five um, in use at all times? At the moment they are, yes. Right. Has that been the case for, uh, for a number of years? Sorry? Has that been a case for a number of years? Um, it depends what you mean by a number of years. Is the, the operating theatres are there to provide the activity that, that's required. So mm -hmm. at the moment, the hospital is uh, uh, doing a, a marvellous job in, in uh, meeting their uh, activity targets. Uh, if you're aware, uh, during COVID, unfortunately, yeah. we were unable to perform a number of elective surgery, and uh, we have been uh, diligently across the district, and, and this hospital in particular, has done its very best to, to catch up basically on the fact that we were unable to do elective surgery. And, as at the end of uh, June, we believe that the hospital will have achieved its targets of having nobody waiting outside of its clinical time frames for, for surgery, which I think is, a, is a, a very good effort by all the staff. How many hospitals are in the Hunter New England LHD? Um, look, at the top of my head, I, I think the, the word hospital is a bit, a bit challenging. We have a, a, a hospitals, huge number. Hospitals, MPSs, um, how, how many facilities are you in charge of? Quite a few. Um, quite a few. Quite you, a few. You, don't, you don't know the exact number? Um, I don't know the exact number, but what, I do... How long have you been CEO of the Hunter New I've England? I've been CEO oh. for 10 years. What, what I do so, know is that we do have... Okay, so 10 a, years, so can... Okay, just, yeah, oh, no, no, I think it goes... Okay, no, no, yep. uh, that's, that's, I would like... Okay, we've, you've, we've been been CEO, been, you've been CEO... You've been CEO for 10... Listen, can I just... We've been... This has gone very well, so I think. Okay. If we just go back and forth with the question, so yep. pose a question, answer and back and forth. So okay, yep. Mr. Chair, I accept that. So you've been CEO for 10 years? Yes, I have. How many hospitals and MPSs are in your local health system? Can I take the exact number on notice? But we, we have facilities of, of up to 100 facilities across our, 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 our district. Up to 100 facilities? Yeah. Why would you say up to 100 facilities? So you're including MPSs? Yeah, we, we have, uh, we have uh, if, if I can help you here, we, we have three tertiary, tertiary referral hospitals. Yep. We have a number of, uh, we heard earlier, rural referral, referral hospitals, which... Uh, one has now been changed to, to uh, being referred as a base hospital with basically the same role delineation as a, as a, role, uh, as a rural referral hospital. We have a range of district ho hospitals, we have a range of community hospitals, we have a range of MPSs, we have a range of community health services, a number of outreach services, we have a, a number of remote health services. So I do apologise. The, the, the number is, is a large number. I don't know the, the exact nope. number, but I'm happy to... Can I ask you a question? Why do you not know the exact number? Is it because it changes? Does it? Does a hospital suddenly close and reopen? Chair, chair, I want to take a no, point no, of no. Order. This no, is I'm a fair question. Order. I'm going to take a point of order. Well, uh, yep. well, we'll stop the clock. So, point of order. Yep. That, that, it seems to me the line of question was reasonable, but uh, no, no. Well, chair, um, the witness has already taken it on notice. He provided an, an explanation as to why he's going to take it on notice. Uh, for the Honourable Walt Secord to continue down this uh, path of questioning, he's only wasting his time, but also it's badgering the witness. And he's, he's actually got, there's a procedural fairness resolution that we've all got yeah, to adopt. I, I do so I'd ask the Honourable <coughs> Walt Secord to move on. I take the Honourable Wes, Wes Fang's point on notice, takes Wes, point, Wes, Wes's point, and Mr. DiLorenzo, yes, you can take the number of hospitals and medical facilities that you're in charge of, the exact number, on notice. Well, I mean, I, I want to intervene here because I'm, I'm quite unclear about this. The question, the question okay. started off with hospitals, <laughs> uh, and then you, you went through and yep. you named a number of establishments, if I could describe it that way, or facilities, and then towards the end you added in community, etc., etc. Yeah, et because we provide a, a wide range of services. Well, yeah, so there's emerging... Uh, so you need to be clear about what the question on notice yeah. is for the purpose sure. of actually answering okay. it. So it goes beyond bricks and mortar to other things. Is that what you're actually asking for in terms of... I would like both. Well, I would like to know the number of facilities, number of hospitals, MPSs and facilities that you're in charge of. Okay. I'd okay. like to move on. Now, Dr. Roberts gave evidence earlier involving um, Dr. Emil Gaid. Now, you've been around for 10 years. Yes. So 10 years. 
um, he gave the impression that the local health district had said, okay, let's put that in the past. That was the impression that he gave. Now, in fact, what about the ongoing treatment to those women who are still living in the community? And what is the status of the cases before the local health district? Yeah, again, um, it's, been very, it's been a very sad situation for those women. And, uh, and again, um, apologies for, for what they've gone through. Um, we are continuing to provide support to, to those women. I think you heard Dr. Roberts say that he is still treating some of those women in his outpatient clinic. So I can give you a firm commitment that the district and Manning Hospital is continuing to care for those women, and we will continue to care for those women. Now, I understand that there was, there was some movement to do a class action suit against the local health district from those women. Is that correct? I'm not aware of a class action against the local health district. No. Are you aware of any legal proceedings or malpractice suits against the local health district? Not against the local health district, no. No. Okay. Now, you said that there's around 100 services in your local health district. Does telehealth play a role in those facilities? Yeah, telehealth plays a significant role in, in our facilities. Um, a very important role, and uh, it's a role that actually complements and actually uh, assists patients in not having to travel unnecessary distances where it's appropriate, yep. and also assists in, in us having clinicians who don't spend a, uh, time traveling while they can spend more time actually providing direct clinical care. Are there certain things that you say are no-go areas and you don't do them on telehealth? Or if you're in an MPS and you're a nurse on a weekend, there's no doctor, do you just, you, telehealth is, is the way to go? No. Um, our, our telehealth system is, is about providing that complementary care and care where it's appropriate. So if you take the example you're giving of, a, of an MPS, yep. well, the MPS is that uh, we roster a, a doctor to be available to that MPS or to any of our, our hospitals in our rural areas. If, if we are unable to have a doctor on site, then what we do is we then have a system of a telehealth system where we have a doctor who is available to provide that assistance. Okay, so of the around 100 services, hospitals, and everything that you have yep. under your purview, yep. um, last weekend, and if you don't know this now, you can take it on notice. Yep. How many of those facilities relied on telehealth and had no doctor on premises? I would have to take that on, on notice. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm better no, off taking it on notice. I no, 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 I am. Uh, do you, does your local health service rely on telehealth frequently on weekends involving MPSs? Uh, not frequently, no. Not frequently. Now, when a doctor is on the other end, the clinician that the nurse seeks advice from, yep. is that person always from within the local health district or can it be from like Newcastle, Tamworth? Can it also be Sydney? Uh, we don't utilize Sydney. What, what we do utilize is our resources within our local health district. Mm -hmm. And in some of our rural areas, we actually rely on what's known as the STAR program. So what, uh, it's so called the STAR program. Sorry, I don't familiar with that. Can you Sorry. have time just to give a brief, very yeah, brief? It's, a, it's an after-hour service that is in partnership with uh, our primary health network. Because our primary health network is also charged with providing after-hours uh, GP coverage. So ah. therefore, where we have a, a, a hospital where the GP is not available, then we have very experienced general practitioners that work in the primary health network who provide that particular service. So is this, is this STAR... The, the STAR, which you're yep. referring to, is that a, a service that's for-profit? Like that's a private enterprise that provides doctors for telehealth? It's funded by the Commonwealth through the Primary Health Network. So it's a basically government-funded in which it provides that service for backup after-hours GP services where there isn't an after-hours GP in some of our rural towns. Okay. So... Previously, when we had, um, when we gave, um, when we conducted hearings in Cobar, Deniliquin, Wellington, Dubbo, yep. after I asked a series of questions about telehealth, a number of doctors and nurses came to me and said, yes, telehealth does have benefits and merits in situations. And they said, but sometimes we're worried that when um, telehealth involves doctors that reside overseas. And I go, you mean foreign trained doctors. They said, no, no, you're misunderstanding us. 
that sometimes telehealth is provided from Europe? We, we don't have any telehealth provided outside of our, our district. Can I give you an example? Of, yep. th there's a wide range of different telehealth um, principles here. So there's, there's telehealth that we provide that actually supports um, our smaller emergency departments when they do get a, a particular patient, whether they've got a GP or a, or a doctor in the hospital, mm -hmm. that actually requires specialist advice. And we call them critical care cameras and critical care telehealth. And we provide that uh, from our two major uh, tertiary centres. One last question. And one would be John Hunter providing from our John Hunter ED and ICU, and the other one is from Tamworth okay. through its emergency pump. So we now, have specialised emergency medicine doctors who provide advice to the doctor in the small hospital mm -hmm. to help them treat that patient. That's one particular type of telehealth. One last question, I'll, and uh, this is my last question. Doc, um, Mr. DiRenzo or Dr. Choi, you could answer yep. this. Are there occasions and have there been occasions where deaths have been certified by nurses with doctors through telehealth? Meaning that they've put a person who has clearly passed away in front of the camera to indicate to the doctor so the doctor, doctor can then certify that the person has passed away? Um. Look, I, I'll, I'll take that on notice. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, when you aware. take that on notice, yeah. can you also tell me in 2020 how many times that occurred? Yeah. Sure, okay. thank you. You can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we heard today um, that often when there's funding provided, there's little or no consultation with local healthcare professionals where that money should specifically be sent. Um, we heard evidence that new beds were purchased that don't actually fit in the radiology rooms, that millions were spent on a car park that added just 12 new car spaces. Um, what, what's going on here? What, where's that communication collapsing? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure what, why the communication is, is, is collapsing. I think what you're talking about is the, the last two major um, um, capital works or, or major expansions to, the, to Manning Hospital. So they were uh, the last uh, two projects. The, the first one, I, I think, what people were talking about was uh, our uh, chemotherapy and our renal dialysis uh, units that we built. Um, and then following that, it's the most recent one, is the um, much larger and expanded uh, diagnostic and pathology centre that, that was actually built. Um, again, we did community consultation. We did... Uh, they, were both, they both had uh, service planning as part of the establishment of those, those two projects. We had a number of staff involved, everybody was involved. Uh, if I can talk about the renal dialysis and... Uh, um, actually, I, yeah. I mean, I'm, what I'm quite interested in, I mean, it sounds yeah. like you're saying that there was consultation, but if there was consultation and, and people were working in those spaces, then how did these things happen? How, how are we now hearing reports that beds don't even fit in the rooms? I'm just wondering, have you done any investigation or are you planning to do any kind of work to find out what went wrong? Well, I, I haven't heard of any reports where the beds don't fit and, <coughs> and so on. So I'm happy to have a talk to the general manager and, and, and get more information. And definitely, it's, it's, I think it's basically quite clear that we, we need to have these spaces work effectively. What I can tell you is the feedback that I'm getting from patients and I'm getting from our clinicians and staff using that, those areas. It's a major improvement of what they had and that they are very, very happy in what they're doing and we're getting compliments back from our patients. Um, if, if I can just mention, Dr. Choi is actually the leader of our uh, renal stream and may be able to just give you a little bit about, about one of those projects, which is the, the, the renal I, I, stream. I won't go there just because I've okay. got a very short amount of time. Sure. Um, uh, I've, I've got another question about something else that um, was brought up today about private charities fundraising to buy um, needed medical equipment. Yep. Um, so we heard from Manning Valley Push for Palliative that, that, that they fundraised and donated specialty um, specialist palliative care equipment for Manning Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, were you aware that this was happening? Yeah, look, uh, I've got to say that uh, we, we are blessed with the number of uh, organisations of people who fundraise for hospitals and uh, they do it, they do it quite willingly and, and they do it uh, uh, passionately and committed to, to help the hospital get more and more equipment. But what I can say is that we do provide equipment and uh, while that particular organisation do, does a great job, it just means that it gives us more ability to purchase even more, more equipment across our hospitals. But I do need to say that if for some reason they were unable to help us, then patients requiring the palliative equipment will get that palliative equipment. So you're saying that you, you haven't been providing that palliative equipment because 
these fundraisers have done it on behalf of the LHD, but if they stopped fundraising, that the LHD would step in and actually pay for the, that equipment themselves. Exactly. And we, we do that many times, but we actually um, welcome um, and uh, appreciate what, what they do. Uh, we also received a number of submissions which raised concerns about the four-hour KPI in emergency departments and how this was potentially leading to patients being discharged um, before it was appropriate and yep. just to meet that K KPI. Yep. Um, are you aware of this and, and is any work being done to ensure that patients are genuinely getting the help that they need um, and are being legitimately charged within, 40, for, sorry, within four hours? Um, the four hours is... It, it, is what is regarded as best practice, you could say. We also have a range of other uh, indicators to actually be able to uh, satisfy us that at the, end of the, at the end of the day we are still providing the best quality care. Those other indicators are not indicating in any way that if patients are able to be discharged or to be um, um, discharged from hospital or to be admitted to, admitted to hospital, that the four hours is, is creating some form of quality issue or safety issue. Just recently also at, at Manning ba Base Hospital, we looked at some of that activity and we undertook a, an internal review of quality and safety within um, the emergency department and we discovered that it's performing extremely well and there's some areas for improvement that we're working with our clinical staff to actually address. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Dorenzio, just going back to the evidence we heard uh, this afternoon by Manning Valley push for palliative in terms of your responses just then to my colleague. Yep. That doesn't seem to match with respect to the evidence that they did present today, yep. that it's far more, um, more like the fact that they, they have assessed that there aren't essential services being provided in terms of palliative care and hence they're needing to raise the money for it. I understand that for example, they have had to co-fund for six months a palliative care clinical nurse consultant position. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I was referring to equipment when I was making that, those comments because I believe the question was around palliative care equipment provided to... They also said in their submission, let's stick to equipment then. Yeah, sorry. They also said in their submission that in order to have an adequate and accessible yep. supply of essential items, the community has had to source and buy its own. Yep. So I just, with respect, your evidence is suggesting that this is something that the, the Manning Valley push for palliative is doing... Uh, as something that they wish to just do, to volunteer for something to do. No. But their evidence was clear today that the LHD is not funding palliative care to the uh, needs demonstrated in this community. Do you accept that? No, what I'm saying is that that, that that group is working with us to ensure that we have appropriate and timely equipment to people with palliative care. The reason that they submitted to us today that they are fundraising, I'm sure a lot of them would prefer to be having cocktails in the sun, but they are, they are fundraising because there is not the funding provided and the services for palliative care. It's a very detailed submission. Mm -hmm. so, they, so, so you do admit that they have potentially requested to the LHD to fund certain things that you have not been able to fund I'm, I'm, happy to take, I'm happy to take that on notice to make sure that, that that's correct. What I do know is that we do provide equipment to palliative care patients requiring palliative care in the community. I'm sure you provide equipment, but ha are you receiving feedback within this community that there aren't enough palliative care services for the amount of people yeah. who need palliative care? This is services and equipment. But I think you're talking now about services. I, services I, I was, and equipment. Okay, I, I was making the comment about equipment that we actually do provide equipment to palliative care. Do you patients. provide enough equipment? Well, uh, I think some of our issues may be that it's the timing of when equipment is provided and then we need to work with other organisations to ensure that we get that right. Mr. Dorenzo, I, of course, we, we, I'm sure you're in this you know, position where you uh, have to do what you need to do with the money that the government provides you within the LHD. Mm -hmm. We have heard some alarming evidence this afternoon about uh, the lack of ENT yep. uh, uh, positions within the public health system. 
have you advocated for more ENT positions within the CCLHD? Yes, yes we have and uh, we've, we've had a, a couple of attempts of getting ENT into the, into the local um, community. Um, it's been challenging and difficult. Uh, predominantly it's, it's the lack of available ENT uh, specialists that wish to come to Manning and, and provide a, a service that is safe and reliable. Uh, right at this moment uh, we're working with the, the Mayo Private Hospital who have been able to just recently get an ENT surgeon to come to, to Manning and we're, we're going to be seeing whether we can come up with some arrangement to provide some ENT or, or the formation of ENT through um, partnering with the Mayor. So for, public, so for public health patients to reduce waiting lists from what we're hearing is four, five, six years. The um, LHD recognises that's a problem? Yeah, it, it, it is a problem, yes. Have you, do you also advocate to the government or to the minister when you're, um, I'm assuming, talking with him at some point about yeah. the lack of health services in the region, do you advocate for more public outpatient clinics, for example? We heard about this in Gunnedah. We've yep. heard about it today. Yep. Um, the extreme concern at the lack of public outpatient clinics. Yeah, we do. And... Uh I think you, you heard Dr. Roberts that uh, we are the only uh, local health district uh, here that provides public uh, outpatient clinics for, for gynaecology. We, we started that, 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 that service here. Um, in all of our um, clinical service planning and when we look at expansion of our hospital services, we prioritise outpatient clinics and do our very best to increase our ability and our range of outpatient clinics. And again, we'll, we'll be looking at that as we um, further develop uh, Manning Hospital with its recent $100 million um, capital increase. That was my time, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, yeah. We, might, we are going to come back, yeah. but the government's chance now. Yeah, yeah, so can I just ask you this? Uh, some of the evidence we heard this morning in Canada related to the use of locums in uh, Canada Hospital. Um, I think you'd agree with me that that's hardly a sustainable model. Mm. Would you like to comment on why that's being used and what you're doing to correct it? Yeah, um, I agree. It's, it's not sustainable. Um, it's uh, very high cost. Um, and if we can come up with better models and better ways to uh, medically coverage those hospitals, it would return a lot of our clinical budget back into more frontline services. And um, we are relying on locums because of the inability to, to attract medical staff to, to many of those smaller hospitals, in particular uh, the challenges with uh, GPs in rural areas and the, and the, um, the inability of, of uh, the old GP VMO model uh, going into the future. So we're looking at a range of, uh, of, of ways to improve that. Um, one, of the, one of those um, complementary services I mentioned earlier is, is telehealth. And appropriate telehealth uh, backed up by uh, nurse practitioners and uh, increasing the skill and scope of our nursing staff, increasing uh, the range of allied health staff that can also help in those hospitals will go a long way to sustaining some of those services. So do I take it, and uh, the, the, the evidence wasn't effectively elicited, I think, by me today, but uh, do I take it that one of the problems that you've had in Gunnedah Hospital is that um, you've actually had a reduction in the number of VMOs because GPs have withdrawn essentially interest in being VMOs in Gunnedah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Fortunately, there was a large number of GPs in the town and, and, and that, that number of GPs also worked in the hospitals on the on-call roster within our emergency department. Unfortunately, as those numbers have diminished, less are able to work in the, in, in, in the hospital we can't rely on, on making it too onerous for the remaining GPs because we need them. Otherwise, well. they'll just walk. Otherwise, out. they'll just walk. So what we do as best as possible is then bring in locum um, doctors to actually relieve the burden on the existing GPs um, as a first call and also make sure that we've got a doctor in the, in the hospital as well. So we heard some evidence by, I think it was Kate Ryan, a nurse practitioner. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but she, uh, in a sense, uh, put a, uh, I think you could say, a business case for the use of nurse practitioners 
particularly in the area of um, diabetes, um, and that that be an outreach service into Gunnedah. Mm -hmm. um, you know I'm from Tamworth, so <laughs> uh, I'm interested in are you attracted in terms of the prop proposition of nurse practitioners? And I suppose the second question is, is where do you get the nurse practitioners mm. from if that's going to be the model going forward? Yeah, um, it's a challenge in itself. So the answer is yes, um, of course. Um, and I, uh, Hunter New England has the largest number of nurse practitioners across any other local health district. And uh, um, well, can I, again, can I just stop you there? Yeah. Uh, what I'd be interested in, either in your evidence here now or later, yeah. is I think I'm not being unfair when I say Ms. Ryan was sceptical about the proportion of those nurse practitioners in terms of their location. Are they all in Newcastle? Mm -hmm. and if they're not in Newcastle, where are those nurse practitioners? Yes. I, well, I, I can tell you that uh, of the uh, 50 or so, I think, uh, I'm happy to provide the exact number, but of, over 50, um, there are uh, of the order of over 20 in, in, um, in rural areas. Um, we does we, that we, mean we have a large in Maitland or does sorry it, does that mean they're in Maitland or does it mean that they're actually more dispersed? Um, I think what I can tell you if, if, if we talk about Taree because I've looked at that coming here sure. today we, we have eight here in, in, in Manning, right. um, which I think is 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 is, a, is pretty good in relation to to the number of nurse practitioners that we do have across the state. One of the things that we are doing is running a, a major program in um, in in gaining more nurse practitioners. The challenge, of course, is a bit like getting specialised medical staff, because we're talking about now specialised nursing, and uh, when we can't get a nurse practitioner, we actually do our very best to upskill a, a registered nurse to provide not all those elements that a nurse practitioner can undertake, but, but try to upskill and get some of those, that, those additional qualities that, that we do need in nursing in some of our hospitals. All right, now my final question really goes to what I think is the elephant in the room, and particularly this room, but it really uh, applies across the whole Hunter New England system. Yep. And that's really the question of uh, essentially the, um, the provision of network services. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing some things here or not here? Why are you doing them in, uh, in Newcastle? And I think I know that part. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing some things in Tamworth? and not doing others. I, I, I want to understand what the rationale for your model is. Yes. Look, I, I could spend the whole evening talking about it because... Well, you um, might it, have given it, that opportunity. It, so. it, it, no, it, 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 it is critical to the way that we provide services across our district, and I believe it's critical about how we should be providing services going into the future to ensure that smaller hospitals and communities get, get access to those specialised services that I think you've been hearing are very difficult and challenging to, to, to be able to one, um, attract, and then sustain, and then more importantly, grow. So could, could I just pass, pass that question on yeah, to I, Dr. I Peter Choi? And actually. the only reason, the only no, sorry, there's a lot of reasons, but <laughs> what I mean, Peter's actually a leader of one of those networks, so it would be good to come from one of the, our clinical leaders on, on how they work and why they're important. Thank you. Um, I'm grateful for the question. Um, I mean, I guess by background, I'm a kidney specialist and a general physician and most of my working life has been around organizing networks for what is a highly complex uh, and expensive skill to be able to provide it on an equitable basis um, in all the areas that I'm involved in and that's been here and also in the UK. And this, I think in terms of the issues that we've been discussing speaks to two things of great importance. One is the issue of retention of medical staff in rural and country areas and the second is the safety of the clinical services that are provided. The basic um, balance, if you like, the payoff is between having all clinical services locally provided against the understanding that there are many services that require scale, expertise and patient numbers. And that becomes more and more of an issue the more technical and specialised the area of medicine that you provide. This is not an issue that's unique to Australian medicine. It preoccupies the NHS. It preoccupies all public health services. Um, what the evidence shows is that in some situations, local services are helpful 
but very often local services can't sustain the infrastructure or the patient numbers for staff experience to provide a fully functional service. And that's a really important thing because there's no, we've already heard today about the implications of employing someone to do a specialist skill that the facility could not provide. We've heard that very clearly and we've seen the consequences of that. So these are not small issues. And it, it, for me, it's the nub of the whole, the whole focus of this inquiry. So to answer your question, it, each network for each specialty has to be organized um, depending on the locality, the services available, the staffing that's available, and the specific service that's provided. But I can give you an example of the service I know most intimately, which is the, um, the nephrology service of Hunter New England. So there are aspects of nephrology that are highly complex. So transplantation, um, highly, highly specialized services that can only be provided in Newcastle. Uh, and we provide those services with a view to how we can sustain um, patients from more distant areas, from country areas. And then as we get to services that are less technical, that, um, that are able to be um, managed at a local level, then we work those through. And so that's why we have a renal unit in Tari. That's why we have a renal unit in Tamworth. And we have a network of community dialysis units they're not managed in isolation by the local hospital management. They are managed as part of a network within Hunter New England, so all of the specialists can support each other in terms of their professional development, in terms of, again, the issue that we talked about today, the audit and the monitoring of their activity and the outcomes of their work. Um, so that I can tell you, for instance, if we um, network a specialist unit in Tari, as we've had, as we've done, we know that the outcomes there are safe because we're networked. Um, I could go on, I'm just wondering if I should stop. I, well, I, don't look, know if I, I think you're going to have another chance to reboot <laughs> after another round, sir. Uh, now, can I just jump in with a couple of questions uh, before we commence the new round? Um, uh, yeah. We'll do, um, do, we'll do another five each, another ten each. I reckon it's well. Yep. We got all night. Nothing planned <laughs> no, within reason. I mean, do you want to do another? No, 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 okay. We understand that uh, it's been a busy day. Did you want to allocate another ten minutes each? Look, or? I, I, look I think that the government and the cross, sorry, the opposition of the cross is entitled to their full amount of time. So um, we'll see how we're going in terms of the government. Yeah, 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 no, no. No, I, I've got no more apart from that. Okay, well. Um, well, let's, uh, let's do 7.5 minutes, <laughs> uh, but I can I just jump in. Uh, with respect to one of the earlier questions today, um, there was a, a matter of the, uh, when will be the publishing of, or the uh, public availability of the, the new, as we understand it, new uh, Hunter New England LHD clinical services uh, document, mm -hmm. um, uh, when it will be released and publicly available. Can, can you enlighten us in regards to the timing of that? Uh, yes. Uh a clinical services plan is the, the document that the um, BLHD produces yep. um, and then basically it, it uh, is approved by New South Wales Health yep. and once approved then uh, the local health district with hospital management then is able to start to put in place uh, the necessary yep. elements of that. So my question is plan. when will it become publicly available? It, uh, t uh, typically they're, they're not publicly available documents. So a clinical services plan is uh, usually for the local health district to introduce and uh, what we do with clinical services plans is that we then come and consult and discuss with the community the main elements of the clinical services plan. So if I can give you an example. Well, uh, before we you go on, I mean yeah. I've got a document in front of me which is Hunter New England Health uh, Lower Mid North Coast Clinical Services Plan 2013 to 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, published in July 2013. So I mean yeah. that's obviously a public available document. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, I'll withdraw that. That's then. right. No, they're that. not publicly available. Uh, okay, uh, and my second question... So, sorry, is if, if I can just no, mention, please, it's important, yes. is that um, we have in place now uh, a schedule where I, I will be, um, during the month of uh, July, coming to the region and actually presenting to a range of uh, our, clini our, our clinical and our community stakeholders 
the outcome of the clinical services plan and uh, uh, discussing the major elements and services that we intend to move forward with the new development. I recently did that at Gunnedah and it was uh, taken very positively by the community. Mike, thank you very much. My second and final question is this. With respect to palliative care, um, uh, it's, I think, taken as a given uh, about the uh, population here and its growth, uh, uh, expected growth, the, the average age or the median age and, and uh, that ageing that's just taking place. Yes. Uh, you would be aware that there's been, I'll use the word agitation, lobbying, call it what you wish, for a... Uh, a not 0.5 uh, full-time equivalent a palliative care specialist, but in fact a palliative care specialist here. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the people who are primarily involved in advocating for this and articulating this are, are not happy, I think it's fair to say, with the 0.5 of a full-time equivalent. When can they expect to have a full-time palliative care specialist working in this area? Well, we, we have listened to, to the community and our clinicians and uh, what we have put in place for the first time is actually an acute palliative care service which was not present in the hospital. So I think in the past we've been talking about community palliative care and the, and the role that we play out there in the community. But we do now have uh, a staff specialist, uh, 0.5, because the rest of the appointment is a, a university and research appointment. And that particular um, specialist for us is playing an enormous role. And I think we're very grateful to to have the calibre of the person. I so don't think it's in we've but got that. We've also my got was, My question was, yeah. uh, we know the demography here, we yeah. know what's happening. When can people expect to have one full-time palliative care specialist based here in Tauri? Well, we, we are going to grow that, that particular service. We have now got a CNC. We're, we are now growing that particular service and we're going to let the director, basically, of palliative care, which is our new position, work with us in attracting more palliative care physicians. So I take it that there's no timetable there? There's no exact date at the okay. moment. Possible. Mr. Um, Mr. DiRenzo, this morning the Bureau of Health Information data was released, independent data, and it showed that 25% of patients receiving elective surgery at Tamworth Hospital, 25% were not performed on time. So why are three operating theatres at that major hospital empty. And we had evidence today that it was used for storage and places to make quiet telephone calls rather than performing surgery. Well, the reason for that is that, that uh, when TAM was, was redeveloped, it was redeveloped with uh, a plan that it would have the capacity to be able to grow into the future and into future activity. Um, we, we at the moment, uh, I only just recently spoke to the Medical Staff Council last Thursday night about the prospect of utilising the sixth theatre and we went through a process where they do get access to that theatre at, the, at, at the moment and we're working together to see whether we need to access that theatre on a, on a full-time basis as opposed to... The, we, we've been doing a remarkable number of additional surgery at places like Tamworth, as I mentioned earlier. 25% are not performed on, do, on, on time though. So, but don't you think that... Well, one of the reasons for that is because of the delays because of COVID and, that, and we were unable to provide. You can't tell me that those three theatres were empty because of COVID. They were empty and not used prior to COVID. No, those three theatres have not been required because of the activity. I think the community possible. might have a different view whether they're required. Now, do you think it's acceptable that cleaners look after dementia patients at Manning Hospital? That I don't believe cleaners look after dementia patients. Well, that was the evidence hospital. we received earlier well, today. I'll, I'll need to follow that up, but I don't believe the cleaners do, do that. And if they were, I, I would know because I, I would assume that um, the cleaners themselves would want to take that, bring that to our attention. Okay, now, well, that, if you're going to take, if you're going to investigate that. Now, nine out of 18 beds in the emergency department are funded, half. So what is, the, what, what is happening with the other? Well, that, that's actually not, not correct. That's uh, not the, correct either. No, that's it's not correct. The, the, the funding of the emergency department is based on the activity that goes through the emergency department. So mm -hmm. it's funded on the patients that go through the, the department. There are no treatment spaces in the emergency department that, that, that are closed, not being utilised. Do you use short-stay units in Tamworth-based hospital to get around the four-hour emergency department bench? Mark? There is a, there is an, the, the emergency short stay units are a model of care in all of the uh, emergency departments that have the ability to put that particular model of care So the of answer is in. yes, you do use No, the it. answer is no. The answer is no, oh, you don't use short stay. No, we use short stay un units as a model of care in emergency departments. 
So yes or no? I'm not sure what the question well, was. Well, the answer was very clear. Do you use yeah. short stay units in Tamworth Hospital to get around the four hour benchmark? Not, to get, not to get around the four hour benchmark, not at all. We, Do you we, use them, yes or no? You know, we use emergency short stay units as a model of care in our emergency departments to provide the highest possible level Dr. of Choi, care. Dr. Choi, you're a medical professional. Do you use short no. stay units? You don't use them? We, we use them, but we use them for appropriate clinical care, not to fiddle the figures up, which I think is the question. So what do you use them for then? They're for short stay clinical scenarios that don't require a full admission, um, but are longer than uh, is required to stay in the ED. Right. So are, they in e are they in emergency departments, these short stay units? You've had a fair go on this one. Uh, uh, I'm going to keep sorry, going, Mr. No, no, Chair. No, no, you are a willful man and you will continue for as long as I give you. So I'm saying no. It's over to Kate Fairman. Uh, you're a stronger man than me. Uh, uh, Kate Fairman. I've got, I've got more. I'm sure you questions. have. Uh, and there are things called supplementary questions as well. So, Kate Fairman. So how is, how is funding allocated between Newcastle and the rest of the LHD area? We've heard concerns um, that it seems to be quite Newcastle heavy from uh, this area as well, from witnesses in this area as well as Gunnedah, as well as Tamworth. Right. Well, the, the funding is allocated to each hospital based on uh, activity-based funding. Um, can, can I just make a comment is that I, I heard earlier about the fact that the, the hospital here has, has reduced funding. You'll see in the document that, that, I, that I've given you, in 2016-17 the budget for, for the Manning Hospital was uh, just over 97 million and the funding for 2021, the year just about to uh, complete, is uh, over 118 million. That's an over 20 percent increase in, in funding to the hospital. So I, I, I don't believe that we have been reducing services over the last five Does years. Does that include, is that part of that 22, is that part of the upgrade that we have heard, the 20 million or 22 that million dollars in That was capital, this is recurrent funding. Okay, so with, with activity based funding then, for example, with Gunnedah Hospital today, yep. we heard from a number of witnesses and in the submissions that there are lots of people just being diverted to Tamworth. Does that affect the funding that Gunnedah is going to get then if less activity goes through Gunnedah Hospital? You know? No, it does not. Uh, the Gunnedah, Gunnedah Hospital is funded on activity-based funding and it's also then <coughs> provided with additional funding given that it is a, a rural district hospital and has additional costs uh, which metropolitan hospitals don't incur, such as the patient transportation cost to actually take patients, say, to Tamworth if they require high level of care. The ever-increasing cost of locums, they're just a couple of examples of, of why their particular cost structure is higher than it would be in a hospital in metropolitan Sydney. We've or, or heard that we have heard this from some other hospitals that we have visited as part of this inquiry, particularly smaller rural hospitals of this, um, of this kind of vicious circle, if you, a vicious cycle, if you like, of less people going into the emergency department yep. because they can't be treated there or they've heard of poor service, they prefer to drive the 100 kilometres to the next hospital. That does affect activity-based funding though, doesn't it? Uh, those numbers are extremely low. But please, I'm just asking a general, I am asking a very specific mm. question here. Yep. It's a fact, isn't it? With activity-based funding, if you don't have the activity, the hospital gets less funding, so it is a bit of a vicious cycle. Well, the, the funding comes in different, in different activity streams. So there's, there's emergency department, then there's inpatient, then there's rehab and so on. Also, the funding is not just... Can we just, just stick pure, to the emergency just, department? Yeah. I do, and it, again, it's just, a, it's just a fact where committee members trying to find information yeah. and take it as a question from me, yeah. wanting to understand how this activity-based funding works for emergency departments. So with activity-based funding, it does fund the amount of people, patients coming through emergency departments, so the less patients, the less funding for that emergency department. Every year it gets worse if, if less people are going through and tending so, to go 100 kilometres down the road. But at, as I said before, it also gets funding for the fact that it has higher fixed costs and it also has high costs. And I can assure you that the funding to hospitals like Gunnedah do not go down each year, they actually go up. 
The Honourable Nan Tasman um, jones Thank you very much. I just wanted to follow on uh, in relation to nurse practitioners. Yep. And we're seeing a trend um, every year around, um, I think it was about 100 additional nurse practitioners are being registered. Um, New South Wales has a good fair share. Um, yep. And um, overall, I think this, this area has a, a good proportion of that yep. compared to the state. Um, but if, um, as my uh, colleague raised about whether or not we, we look at uh, utilising nurse practitioners more, what would you say in relation to it? It was one of the things that was raised this morning about providing more support um, for nurses to take on becoming a nurse practitioner, similar to what we do with um, doctors in providing, whether it's um, study leave or scholarships or things like that, which would, particularly if you uh, market purely for rural and remote areas, is there scope for that? Yes, there is, and we currently have a, a fund available with, within the district. So within our nursing and midwifery um, uh, unit, there is uh, funds available for nurses who want to undertake further education or training. We actually can sponsor them and assist them in getting that higher education. And is that being utilised at capacity at the moment, or is it, what's the uptake? Uh, the uptake is, is, is uh, for anybody that wishes to undertake it, they put an application in and they will get sponsorship. But are you finding that there is a high demand for it, or is it, um, uh, or not? Um, we, we find that it, it, it fluctuates. Um, it really depends on the at the, um, the 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 registered nurse usually wanting to undertake that particular type of program. Um, it's quite um, a, a challenging program to undertake yeah. for nurse practitioners. So we we promote it heavily, and then we also provide that that assistance in that further education. The other question I'm for hand on is in relation to bed numbers. Now, I was raised this uh, this afternoon that um, the, the number of uh, beds um, here is less than what it should be. Um, first of all, I just want to know what the numbers of beds are, and secondly, whether or not they're at capacity or fully occupied. Yep. Um, well, I've, I've got that information for you in that, in, in that uh, particular information, so on, um, on bed numbers. So uh, we have uh, 202 um, beds. And uh, of those 202 beds, there are 20 specific mental health beds. And I can tell you that uh, right at the moment, um, those beds are, are basically fully occupied. We've had an increase in, um, in um, activity across all of our hospitals across New South Wales. And Manning, um, like all, all the rest, has seen an increasing number of patients requiring admission to, to our hospitals. So at the moment, uh, in talking to, to the general manager, we're, we're basically... Um, at nearly full capacity mm -hmm. and uh, we've been opening up what, what we call our surge beds which is basically our seasonal beds. So what we have across the year is we, we, un we know and it's quite predictable that during of, of onset of winter and winter we, there's going to be more reliance on the hospital with our, with our ageing population and of course as we get into the summer months there's re rest re less reliance on inpatient. So at the moment we're, we're, we're travelling with uh, quite a large number of patients requiring admission. What we also oh, do have sorry. is the ability, um, we have a, an arrangement with uh, Foster Private Hospital, which gives us the ability to utilise uh, around 20 inpatient beds with that particular hospital to assist Manning Hospital, where there are patients who reside in, in the Foster area and would be, would be better catered for at, 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 at towards the end of their inpatient stay to be transferred to uh, Foster and, and uh, have care there. And, uh, and some patients I'll are prepared to utilise that. Uh, Dr Choi, I just wanted to um, touch on uh, some of the points that uh, the Honourable Watts Accord was uh, questioning on earlier around telehealth. And um, we've seen a lot of this political attack on telehealth. Um, but, you know, there was been, there's been a, a run of questions in previous hearings around um, the provision of telehealth and, say, for example, the doctors being overseas. Can you talk about sleep inertia um, and how that would affect a doctor here, you know, getting a call late at night versus a doctor that's fresh and awake overseas? And I know a doctor that uh, does telehealth provision in, in the Riverina for the UK. Do you know of other stories like that where we have this reciprocal arrangement? Because, our, because they're awake during the day, they're more able to provide timely responses to... Um, to provide that telehealth uh, support to uh, medical staff. Yeah. They're not being provided. They're, they're not being provided in the New England area from, from outside the, no, no, the, but, the but, LHD. But, 
Walt actually raised it in this one today. So I, I, I know what he did. But I know, but I'm asking I'm you. I'm sorry, this truly gives a different story. Uh, I'm not going to give a different story, so I, I was going to say that I'm aware of those sort of arrangements. Um, they make a certain amount of intuitive sense to me, but I have no experience and we don't utilize those sort of things, uh, those sort of arrangements in Hunter New England. Yeah. Um, accepting that, but you, you do, um, you have heard of, uh, say, colleagues in Australia that provide that reciprocal help where, uh, you know, late at night um, in yeah. the UK time, it's, you know, obviously daytime here and doctors are more awake and, and the sleep inertia issue isn't, isn't a factor there. Yeah, and, and the other scenario in which that um, arrangement works is uh, radiology reporting. Yes. Thank you. Uh, look, uh, just uh, uh, a couple of things. Uh, obviously, and it goes back to you, Dr. Choi, really, with regards to the network services. Can you explain to me the issue there is clearly in the evidence that we've received today, as you're aware, uh, a push for expanded cardiac services in this area. Do you want to just address that issue? as to why we are at where we are at uh, and why you say, I assume, this is the best model of care. Yeah, look, I think it, it, it comes down to a very careful consideration of uh, what is the best network to run for a particular area. In the context of uh, cardiac catheter lab, we know that that's um, a highly specialized skill that is not reliant on a single specialist. Let's be clear about that. It's reliant on um, having specialized um, technicians, having the correct nurses. We know that if you don't put that together in the right configuration, then your outcomes are not going to be good. So really the model of care that you have to use in terms of the discussion is you have to get everything else in place. Uh, and, and, and work iteratively. I mean, these are not one-off discussions that we're having. I mean, none of these things are set in stone right now. Um, the, the view within uh, my colleagues in the cardiac networks, and I, I don't want to speak for them, um, so I'm going to be careful, is that the current arrangement, which is for acute myocardial infarction in Tari, to be sent directly to John Hunter Hospital without touching um, anybody apart from the emergency department provides the most timely and the safest care. There is so much more over there. Beaten by the bell, as I say. <laughs> uh, well, gentlemen, um, uh, we did push on and uh, we didn't quite get to the one hour that we had promised you, uh, but we're not too far short. And I'm sure that uh, honourable members uh, we'll have some supplementary questions to follow up for anything that they, uh, indeed. Um, but listen, on behalf of the committee, once again, I do apologise uh, for the delay in getting this underway this afternoon. We do appreciate you're very busy in your respective roles, so I sincerely apologise. But uh, thank you for coming along. Thank you for the forthrightness in the way in which you've come along and presented the uh, uh, answers to the questions this afternoon. It's appreciated very much. And uh, yeah, we thank you for the, for the important work and the good work you do on behalf of the New South Wales residents who live within the Hunter and New England uh, Local Health District. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that brings this afternoon's or this evening's now session to a, a close. Uh, can, I, um, can I thank particularly uh, those who are still with us, um, the, um, th those who are hanging in there. Um, we do appreciate it just reflects the interest, the deep interest in Matters Health uh, in this neck of the woods. And so